Mr. Bookman here. Before we go ahead and dive into today's audiobook, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. If you like today's story, make sure you do give us a thumbs up. But as you probably figured, I'm an avid reader, so I don't really get a chance to work out a lot. But I've actually found this new diet pill that guarantees you to lose one pound per day. If you want to check it out, simply just click or copy the link in the description. Now let's get right into the book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www. Dot LibriVox dot org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton, read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter One. On a January evening of the early seventies, Christine Nilsson was singing in Faust at the Academy of Music in New York. Though there was already talk of the erection. In remote metropolitan distances above the forties, of a new opera house which should compete in costliness and splendor with those of the great European capitals, the world of fashion was still content to reassemble every winter in the shabby red and gold boxes of the sociable old academy. Conservatives cherished it for being small and inconvenient. And thus, keeping out the new people, whom New York was beginning to dread, and yet be drawn to, and the sentimental clung to it for its historic associations, and the musical for its excellent acoustics, always so problematic a quality in halls built for the hearing of music. It was Madame Nilsson's first appearance that winter, and what the daily press had already learned to describe as. An exceptionally brilliant audience had gathered to hear her, transported through the slippery, snowy streets in private brooms, in the spacious family landau, or in the humbler but more convenient brown coupe. To come to the opera in a brown coupe was almost as honourable a way of arriving as in one's own carriage, and departure by the same means had the immense advantage of enabling one. With a playful allusion to democratic principles, to scramble into the first brown conveyance in the line, instead of waiting until the cold and gin-congested nose of one's own coachman gleamed under the portico of the Academy. It was one of the great livery stablemen's most masterly intuitions to have discovered that Americans want to get away from amusement even more quickly than they want to get to it. When Newland Archer opened the door at the back of the club box, the curtain had just gone up on the garden scene. There was no reason why the young man should not have come earlier, for he had dined at seven, alone with his mother and sister, and had lingered afterward over a cigar, in the Gothic library with glazed black walnut bookcases and finial-topped chairs. Which was the only room in the house where Mrs. Archer allowed smoking. But in the first place, New York was a metropolis, and perfectly aware that in metropolises it was not the thing to arrive early at the opera. And what was or was not the thing played a part as important in Newland Archer's New York as the inscrutable totem terrors that had ruled the destinies of his forefathers. Thousands of years ago, the second reason for his delay was a personal one. He had dawdled over his cigar because he was at heart a dilettante, and thinking over a pleasure to come often gave him a subtler satisfaction than its realization. This was especially the case when the pleasure was a delicate one, as his pleasures mostly were. And on this occasion, the moment he looked forward to was so rare and exquisite in quality that, well, if he had timed his arrival in accord with the prima donna's stage manager, he could not have entered the academy at a more significant moment than just as she was singing, "He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me," and sprinkling the falling daisy petals. 
with notes as clear as dew. She sang, of course, Mama, and not He Loves Me, since an unalterable and unquestioned law of the musical world required that the German text of French operas sung by Swedish artists should be translated into Italian for the clearer understanding of English-speaking audiences. This seemed as natural to Newland Archer as all the other conventions on which his life was molded, such as the duty of using two silver-backed brushes with his monogram in blue enamel to part his hair, and of never appearing in society without a flower, preferably a gardenia, in his buttonhole. Mama, no mama, the prima donna sang, and mama with a final burst of love triumphant, as she pressed the disheveled daisy to her lips and lifted her large eyes to the sophisticated countenance of the little brown Faust Capul, who was vainly trying, in a tight purple velvet doublet and plumed cap, to look as pure and true as his artless victim. Newland Archer, leaning against the wall at the back of the club box, turned his eyes from the stage and scanned the opposite side of the house. Directly facing him was the box of old Mrs. Manson Mingott, whose monstrous obesity had long since made it impossible for her to attend the opera, but who was always represented on fashionable nights by some of the younger members of the family. On this occasion, the front of the box was filled by her daughter-in-law, Mrs. Lovell Mingott, and her daughter, Mrs. Welland. And slightly withdrawn behind these brocaded matrons sat a young girl in white, with eyes ecstatically fixed on the stage lovers. As Madame Nilsson's Mama trilled out above the silent house, the boxes always stopped talking during the daisy song, a warm pink mounted to the girl's cheek, mantled her brow to the roots of her fair braids, and suffused the young slope of her breast to the line where it met a modest tulle tucker, fastened with a single gardenia. She dropped her eyes to the immense bouquet of lilies of the valley on her knee, and Newland Archer saw her white-gloved fingertips touch the flowers softly. He drew a breath of satisfied vanity, and his eyes returned to the stage. No expense had been spared on the setting, which was acknowledged to be very beautiful, even by people who shared his acquaintance with the opera houses of Paris and Vienna. The foreground, to the footlights, was covered with emerald green cloth. In the middle distance, symmetrical mounds of woolly green moss, bounded by croquet hoops, formed the base of shrubs, shaped like orange trees, but studded with large pink and red roses. Gigantic pansies, considerably larger than the roses, and closely resembling the floral pen wipers made by female parishioners for fashionable clergymen, sprang from the moss beneath the rose trees and here and there a daisy grafted on a rose branch flowered with a luxuriance prophetic of Mr. Luther Burbank's far-off prodigies. In the center of this enchanted garden, Madame Nilsson, in white cashmere slashed with pale blue satin, a reticule dangling from a blue girdle, and large yellow braids carefully disposed on each side of her muslin chemisette, listened, with downcast eyes, to Monsieur Capoul's impassioned wooing, and affected a guileless incomprehension of his designs whenever, by word or glance, he persuasively indicated the ground-floor window of the neat brick villa projecting obliquely from the right wing. The darling, thought Newland Archer, his glance flitting back to the young girl with the lilies of the valley, she doesn't even guess what it's all about. 
and he contemplated her absorbed young face with a thrill of possessorship in which pride in his own masculine initiation was mingled with a tender reverence for her abysmal purity. We'll read Faust together by the Italian lakes, he thought, somewhat hazily confusing the scene of his projected honeymoon with the masterpieces of literature which it would be his manly privilege to reveal to his bride. It was only that afternoon that May Welland had let him guess that she cared, New York's consecrated phrase of maiden avowal, and already his imagination, leaping ahead of the engagement ring, the betrothal kiss, and the march from Lohengrin, pictured her at his side in some scene of old European witchery. He did not, in the least, wish the future Mrs. Newland Archer to be a simpleton. He meant her, thanks to his enlightening companionship, to develop a social tact and readiness of wit enabling her to hold her own with the most popular married women of the younger set, in which it was the recognized custom to attract masculine homage while playfully discouraging it. If he had probed to the bottom of his vanity, as he sometimes nearly did, he would have found there the wish that his wife should be as worldly wise and as eager to please as the married lady whose charms had held his fancy through two mildly agitated years, without, of course, any hint of the frailty which had so nearly marred that unhappy being's life, and had disarranged his own plans for a whole winter. How this miracle of fire and ice was to be created, and to sustain itself in a harsh world, he had never taken the time to think out. But he was content to hold his view without analyzing it, since he knew it was that of all the carefully brushed, white-waistcoated, buttonhole-flowered gentlemen who succeeded each other in the club box, exchanged friendly greetings with him, and turned their opera glasses critically on the circle of ladies who were the product of their system. In matters intellectual and artistic, Newland Archer felt himself distinctly the superior of these chosen specimens of old New York gentility. He had probably read more, thought more, and even seen a good deal more of the world than any other man of the number. Singly, they betrayed their inferiority, but grouped together, they represented New York and the habit of masculine solidarity made him accept their doctrine in all the issues called moral. He instinctively felt that in this respect it would be troublesome, and also rather bad form, to strike out for himself. "'Well, upon my soul!' exclaimed Lawrence Lefferts, turning his opera glass abruptly away from the stage." Lawrence Lefferts was, on the whole, the foremost authority on form in New York. He had probably devoted more time than anyone else to the study of this intricate and fascinating question. But study alone could not account for his complete and easy competence. One had only to look at him, from the slant of his bald forehead and the curve of his beautiful fair moustache, to the long, patent-leather feet at the other end of his lean and elegant person, to feel that the knowledge of form must be congenital in anyone who knew how to wear such good clothes, so carelessly, and carry such height with so much lounging grace. As a young admirer had once said of him, if anybody can tell a fellow just when to wear a black tie with evening clothes, and when not to, it's Larry Lefferts. And on the question of bumps versus patent leather Oxfords, his authority had never been disputed. My God, he said, and silently handed his glass to old Sillerton Jackson. Newland Archer, following Lefferts' glance, saw with surprise that his exclamation 
had been occasioned by the entry of a new figure into old Mrs. Mingott's box. It was that of a slim young woman, a little less tall than May Welland, with brown hair growing in close curls about her temples, and held in place by a narrow band of diamonds. The suggestion of this headdress, which gave her what was then called a Josephine look, was carried out in the cut of the dark blue velvet gown, rather theatrically caught up under her bosom by a girdle with a large, old-fashioned clasp. The wearer of this unusual dress, who seemed quite unconscious of the attention it was attracting, stood a moment in the center of the box, discussing with Mrs. Welland the propriety of taking the latter's place in the front right-hand corner. Then she yielded, with a slight smile, and seated herself in line with Mrs. Welland's sister-in-law, Mrs. Lovell Mingott, who was installed in the opposite corner. Mr. Sillerton Jackson had returned the opera glass to Lawrence Lefferts. The whole of the club turned instinctively, waiting to hear what the old man had to say, for old Mr. Jackson was as great an authority on family as Lawrence Lefferts was on form. He knew all the ramifications of New York's cousinships, and could not only elucidate such complicated questions as that of the connection between the Mingotts, through the Thorleys, with the Dallases of South Carolina, and that of the relationship of the elder branch of the Philadelphia Thorleys to the Albany Chiverses, on no account to be confused with the Manson Chiverses of University Place, but could also enumerate the leading characteristics of each family, as for instance, the fabulous stinginess of the younger lines of Lefferts's, the Long Island ones, or the fatal tendency of the Rushworths to make foolish matches, or the insanity recurring in every second generation of the Albany Chiverses, with whom their New York cousins had always refused to intermarry, with the disastrous exception of poor Medora Manson, who, as everybody knew, but then... Her mother was a Rushworth. In addition to this forest of family trees, Mr. Sillerton Jackson carried between his narrow hollow temples and under his soft thatch of silver hair a register of most of the scandals and mysteries that had smoldered under the unruffled surface of New York society within the last fifty years. So far, indeed, did his information extend, and so acutely retentive was his memory, that he was supposed to be the only man who could have told you who Julius Beaufort, the banker, really was, and what had become of handsome Bob Spicer, old Mrs. Manson Mingott's father, who had disappeared so mysteriously with a large sum of trust money, less than a year after his marriage, on the very day that a beautiful Spanish dancer, who had been delighting thronged audiences in the opera house on the battery, had taken the ship for Cuba. But these mysteries, and many others, were closely locked in Mr. Jackson's breast, for not only did his keen sense of honor forbid his repeating anything privately imparted, but he was fully aware that his reputation for discretion increased his opportunities of finding out what he wanted to know. The club box, therefore, waited, in visible suspense, while Mr. Sillerton Jackson handed back Lawrence Lefferts' opera glass. For a moment he silently scrutinized the attentive group, out of his filmy blue eyes, overhung by old veined lids. Then he gave his mustache a thoughtful twist, and said simply, I didn't think the Mingots would have tried it on. End of chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org.
The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton, read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter Two. Newland Archer, during this brief episode, had been thrown into a state of embarrassment. It was annoying that the box which was thus attracting the undivided attention of masculine New York should be that in which his betrothed was seated between her mother and aunt, and for a moment he could not identify the lady in the Empire dress, nor imagine why her presence created such excitement among the initiated. Then light dawned on him, and with it came a momentary rush of indignation. No, indeed. No one would have thought the Mingotts would have tried it on. But they had. They undoubtedly had. For the low-toned comments behind him left no doubt in Archer's mind that the young woman was May Wellen's cousin, the cousin always referred to in the family as poor Ellen Olenska. Archer knew that she had suddenly arrived from Europe a day or two previously. He had even heard from Miss Welland, not disapprovingly, that she had been to see poor Ellen, who was staying with old Mrs. Mingott. Archer entirely approved of family solidarity, and one of the qualities he most admired in the Mingotts was their resolute championship of the few black sheep that their blameless stock had produced. There was nothing mean or ungenerous in the young man's heart, and he was glad that his future wife should not be restrained by false prudery from being kind, in private, to her unhappy cousin. But to receive Countess Olenska in the family circle was a different thing from producing her in public, at the opera of all places, and in the very box with the young girl whose engagement to him Newland Archer, was to be announced within a few weeks. No, he felt as old Sillerton Jackson felt. He did not think the Mingotts would have tried it on. He knew, of course, that whatever man dared, within Fifth Avenue's limits, that old Mrs. Manson Mingott, the matriarch of the line, would dare— he had always admired the high and mighty old lady who, in spite of having been only Catherine Spicer of Staten Island, with a father mysteriously discredited, and neither money nor position enough to make people forget it, had allied herself with the head of the wealthy Mingott line, married two of her daughters to foreigners, an Italian marquis, and an English banker, and put the crowning touch to her audacities by building a large house of pale, cream-colored stone, when brown sandstone seemed as much the only wear as a frock coat in the afternoon, in an inaccessible wilderness near the Central Park. Old Mrs. Mingott's foreign daughters had become a legend. They never came back to see their mother, and the latter being like many persons of active mind and dominating will, sedentary and corpulent in her habit, had philosophically remained at home. But the cream-colored house, supposed to be modeled on the private hotels of the Parisian aristocracy, was there as a visible proof of her moral courage, and she throned in it, among pre-revolutionary furniture and souvenirs of the Tuileries of Louis Napoleon, where she had shone in her middle age, as placidly as if there were nothing peculiar in living above 34th Street, or in having French windows that opened like doors, instead of sashes that pushed up. Everyone, including Mr. Sillerton Jackson, was agreed that old Catherine had never had beauty, a gift which, in the eyes of New York, justified every success— and excused a certain number of failings. Unkind people said that, like her imperial namesake, she had won her way to success by strength of will and hardness of heart, and a kind of haughty effrontery that was somehow justified by the extreme decency and dignity of her private life. 
Mr. Manson Mingott had died when she was only twenty-eight, and had tied up the money with an additional caution born of the general distrust of the Spicers. But his bold young widow went her way fearlessly, mingled freely in foreign society, married her daughters in heaven knew what corrupt and fashionable circles, hobnobbed with dukes and ambassadors, associated familiarly with papists, entertained opera singers, and, and, was the intimate friend of Madame Taglioni, and all the while, as Sillerton Jackson was the first to proclaim, there had never been a breath on her reputation. The only respect, he always added, in which she differed from the earlier Catherine. Mrs. Manson Mingott had long since succeeded in untying her husband's fortune, and had lived in affluence for half a century. But memories of her early straits had made her excessively thrifty, and though when she bought a dress, or a piece of furniture, she took care that it should be of the best, she could not bring herself to spend much on the transient pleasures of the table. Therefore, for totally different reasons, her food was as poor as Mrs. Archer's, and her wines did nothing to redeem it. Her relatives considered that the penury of her table discredited the Mingott name, which had always been associated with good living. But people continued to come to her in spite of the made dishes and flat champagne, and in reply to the remonstrances of her son Lovell, who tried to retrieve the family credit by having the best chef in New York, she used to say laughingly, "'What's the use of two good cooks in one family, now that I've married the girls and can't eat sauces?' Newland Archer, as he mused on these things, had once more turned his eyes towards the Mingott box. He saw that Mrs. Welland and her sister-in-law were facing their semicircle of critics with a Mingottian aplomb which old Catherine had inculcated in all her tribe, and that only May Welland betrayed, by a heightened color, perhaps due to the knowledge that he was watching her, a sense of the gravity of the situation. As for the cause of the commotion, she sat, gracefully, in her corner of the box, her eyes fixed on the stage and revealing, as she leaned forward, a little more shoulder and bosom than New York was accustomed to seeing, at least in ladies who had reasons for wishing to pass unnoticed. Few things seemed to Newland Archer more awful than an offence against taste, that far-off divinity of whom form was the mere visible representative and vicegerent. Madame Olenska's pale and serious face appealed to his fancy as suited to the occasion and to her unhappy situation. But the way her dress which had no tucker, sloped away from her thin shoulders, shocked and troubled him. He hated to think of May Welland being exposed to the influence of a young woman so careless to the dictates of taste. After all, he heard one of the younger men begin behind him. Everybody talked through the Mephistopheles and Martha scenes. After all, just what happened? Well, she left him. Nobody attempts to deny that. He's an awful brute, isn't he? Continued the young inquirer, a candid Thorley, who was evidently preparing to enter the lists as the lady's champion. The very worst. I knew him at Nice, said Lawrence Lefferts with authority. A half-paralyzed, white, sneering fellow— rather handsome head, but eyes with a lot of lashes. Well, I'll tell you the sort. When he wasn't with women, he was collecting china. Paying any price for both, I understand. There was a general laugh, and the young champion said, Well, then. Well, then she bolted with his secretary. Oh, I see. The champion's face fell. It didn't last long, though. 
I heard of her a few months later living alone in Venice. I believe Lovell Mingott went out to get her. He said she was desperately unhappy. That's all right, but this parading her at the opera is another thing. Perhaps, young Thorley hazarded, she's too unhappy to be left at home. This was greeted with an irreverent laugh, and the youth blushed deeply and tried to look as if he had meant to insinuate what knowing people called a double entendre. Well, it's queer to have brought Miss Welland anyhow, someone said in a low tone with a side glance at Archer. Oh, that's part of the campaign. Granny's orders, no doubt, Lefferts laughed. When the old lady does a thing, she does it thoroughly. The act was ending, and there was a general stir in the box. Suddenly Newland Archer felt himself impelled to decisive action. The desire to be the first man to enter Mrs. Mingott's box, to proclaim to the waiting world his engagement to May Welland, and to see her through whatever difficulties her cousin's anomalous situation might involve her in. This impulse had abruptly overruled all scruples and hesitations, and sent him hurrying through the red corridors to the farther side of the house. As he entered the box, his eyes met Miss Wellens, and he saw that she had instantly understood his motive, though the family dignity which both considered so high a virtue would not permit her to tell him so. The persons of their world lived in an atmosphere of faint implications and pale delicacies, and the fact that he and she understood each other without a word seemed to the young man to bring them nearer than any explanation would have done. Her eyes said, you see why Mama brought me. And his answered, I would not for the world have had you stay away. You know my niece, Countess Olenska, Mrs. Welland inquired, as she shook hands with her future son-in-law. Archer bowed without extending his hand, as was the custom on being introduced to a lady. And Ellen Olenska bent her head slightly, keeping her own pale-gloved hands clasped on her huge fan of eagle feathers. Having greeted Mrs. Lovell Mingott, a large blonde lady in creaking satin, he sat down beside his betrothed and said in a low voice, I hope you've told Madame Olenska that we're engaged. I want everybody to know. I want you to let me announce it this evening at the ball. Miss Welland's face grew rosy as the dawn, and she looked at him with radiant eyes. "'If you can persuade Mama, she said. "'But why should we change what is already settled?' He made no answer, but that which his eyes returned, and she added, still more confidently smiling, "'Tell my cousin yourself. I give you leave. She says she used to play with you when you were children.' She made way for him by pushing back her chair, and promptly, and a little ostentatiously, with a desire that the whole house should see what he was doing, Archer seated himself at the Countess Olenska's side. "'We did used to play together, didn't we?' she asked, turning her grave eyes to his. "'You were a horrid boy and kissed me once behind a door, but it was your cousin Vandy Newland who never looked at me.' that I was in love with. Her glance swept the horseshoe curve of boxes. Ah, oh, how this brings it all back to me. I see everybody here in knickerbockers and pantalettes, she said, with her trailing, slightly foreign accent, her eyes returning to his face. Agreeable as their expression was, the young man was shocked that they should reflect so unseemly a picture of the august tribunal before which, at that very moment, her case was being tried. Nothing could be in worse taste than misplaced flippancy, and he answered somewhat stiffly, Yes, you have been away a very long time. Oh, centuries and centuries, so long, she said, that I'm sure I'm dead and buried, and this dear old place is heaven, which, for reasons he could not define, 
struck Newland Archer as an even more disrespectful way of describing New York society. End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 3 it invariably happened in the same way. Mrs. Julius Beaufort, on the night of her annual ball, never failed to appear at the opera. Indeed, she always gave her ball on an opera night, in order to emphasize her complete superiority to household cares, and her possession of a staff of servants, competent to organize every detail of the entertainment in her absence. The Beaufort's house was one of the few in New York that possessed a ballroom. It even antedated Mrs. Manson Mingott's and the Headley Chiverses, and at a time when it was beginning to be thought provincial to put a crash over the drawing-room floor and move the furniture upstairs, the possession of a ballroom that was used for no other purpose and left for 364 days of the year to shutter darkness— with its gilt chairs stacked in a corner and its chandelier in a bag, this undoubted superiority was felt to compensate for whatever was regrettable in the Beaufort past. Mrs. Archer, who was fond of coining her social philosophy into axioms, had once said, We all have our pet common people. And though the phrase was a daring one, its truth was secretly admitted in many an exclusive bosom. But the Beauforts were not exactly common. Some people said they were even worse. Mrs. Beaufort belonged, indeed, to one of America's most honored families. She had been the lovely Regina Dallas of the South Carolina branch, a penniless beauty introduced to New York society by her cousin, the imprudent Medora Manson, who was always doing the wrong thing from the right motive. When one was related to the Mansons and Rushworths, one had a droit de cite, as Mr. Sillerton Jackson, who had frequented the Tuileries, called it, in New York society. But did one not forfeit it in marrying Julius Beaufort? The question was, who was Beaufort? He passed for an Englishman, was agreeable, handsome, ill-tempered, hospitable, and witty. He had come to America with letters of recommendation from old Mrs. Manson Mingott's English son-in-law, the banker, and had speedily made himself an important position in the world of affairs. But his habits were dissipated, his tongue was bitter, his antecedents were mysterious— and when Medora Manson announced her cousin's engagement to him, it was felt to be one more act of folly in poor Medora's long record of imprudences. But folly is as often justified of her children as wisdom, and two years after young Mrs. Beaufort's marriage, it was admitted that she had the most distinguished house in New York. No one knew exactly how the miracle was accomplished— she was indolent, passive, the caustic even called her dull, but dressed like an idol, hung with pearls, growing younger and blonder and more beautiful each year, she throned in Mr. Beaufort's heavy brownstone palace, and drew all the world there without lifting her jeweled little finger. The knowing people said it was Beaufort himself who trained the servants— taught the chef new dishes, told the gardeners what hothouse flowers to grow for the dinner-table and the drawing-rooms, selected the guests, brewed the after-dinner punch, and dictated the little notes his wife wrote to her friends. If he did, these domestic activities were privately performed, and he presented to the world 
the appearance of a careless and hospitable millionaire strolling into his own drawing-room with the detachment of an invited guest, and saying, "'My wife's gloxinias are a marvel, aren't they? I believe she gets them out from Kew.' Mr. Beaufort's secret, people were agreed, was the way he had carried things off. It was all very well to whisper that he had been helped to leave England by the international banking house in which he had been employed. He carried off that rumor as easily as the rest, though New York's business conscience was no less sensitive than its moral standard. He carried everything before him and all New York into his drawing-rooms, and for over twenty years now people had said they were going to the Beauforts with the same tone of security as if they had said they were going to Mrs. Manson Mingott's, and with the added satisfaction of knowing that they would get hot canvas-back ducks and vintage wines, instead of tepid Veuve Clicquot without a year, and warmed-up croquettes from Philadelphia. Mrs. Beaufort, then, had, as usual, appeared in her box just before the jewel song. And when, again, as usual, she rose at the end of the third act, drew her opera cloak about her lovely shoulders, and disappeared, New York knew that meant that half an hour later the ball would begin. The Beaufort house was one that New Yorkers were proud to show foreigners, especially on the night of the annual ball. The Beauforts had been among the first people in New York to own their own red velvet carpet and have it rolled down the steps by their own footmen under their own awning instead of hiring it with the supper and the ballroom chairs. They had also inaugurated the custom of letting the ladies take their cloaks off in the hall, instead of shuffling up to the hostess's bedroom and recurling their hair with the aid of the gas burner. Beaufort was understood to have said that he supposed all his wife's friends had maids, who saw to it that they were properly quaffed when they left home. Then the house had been boldly planned, with a ballroom, so that instead of squeezing through a narrow passage to get to it, as at the Chiverses, one marched solemnly down a vista of enfiladed drawing-rooms, the sea-green, the crimson, and the bouton d'or, seeing from afar the many-candled lustres reflected in the polished parquetry, and beyond that the depths of a conservatory where camellias and tree-ferns arched their costly foliage over seats of black and gold bamboo. Newland Archer, as became a young man of his position, strolled in, somewhat late. He had left his overcoat with the silk-stockinged footman. The stockings were one of Beaufort's new fatuities. Had dawdled a while in the library hung with Spanish leather and furnished with bull and malachite, where a few men were chatting and putting on their dancing gloves, and had finally joined the line of guests whom Mrs. Beaufort was receiving on the threshold of the crimson drawing-room. Archer was distinctly nervous. He had not gone back to his club after the opera, as the young bloods usually did, but the night being fine had walked for some distance up Fifth Avenue before turning back in the direction of the Beaufort's house. He was definitely afraid that the Mingotts might be going too far, that, in fact, they might have Granny Mingott's orders to bring the Countess Olenska to the ball. From the tone of the club box he had perceived how grave a mistake that would be, and though he was more than ever determined to see the thing through, he felt less chivalrously eager to champion his betrothed's cousin than before their brief talk at the opera. Wandering on to the Bouton d'Or drawing-room, where Beaufort had had the audacity to hang Love Victorious, the much-discussed nude of Beaujeru, Archer found Mrs. Welland and her daughter standing near the ballroom door. Couples were already gliding over the floor beyond, the light of the wax candles 
fell on revolving tulle skirts, on girlish heads wreathed with modest blossoms, on the dashing aigrettes and ornaments of the young married women's coiffures, and on the glitter of highly glazed shirt fronts and fresh glacé gloves. Miss Welland, evidently about to join the dancers, hung on the threshold, her lilies of the valley in her hand. She carried no other bouquet. Her face a little pale, her eyes burning with a candid excitement. A group of young men and girls were gathered about her, and there was much hand-clasping, laughing, and pleasantry, on which Mrs. Welland, standing slightly apart, shed the beam of a qualified approval. It was evident that Miss Welland was in the act of announcing her engagement, while her mother affected the air of parental reluctance, considered suitable to the occasion. Archer paused a moment. It was at his express wish that the announcement had been made, and yet it was not thus that he would have wished to have his happiness known. To proclaim it in the heat and noise of a crowded ballroom was to rob it of the fine bloom of privacy, which should belong to things nearest the heart. His joy was so deep that his blurring of the surface left its essence untouched. But he would have liked to keep the surface pure, too. It was something of a satisfaction to find that May Wellen shared this feeling. Her eyes fled to his beseechingly, and their look said, Remember, we're doing this because it's right. No appeal could have found a more immediate response in Archer's breast. But he wished that the necessity of their action had been represented by some ideal reason, and not simply by poor Ellen Olenska. The group about Mrs. Welland made way for him with significant smiles, and after taking his share of the felicitations, he drew his betrothed into the middle of the ballroom floor and put his arm about her waist. "'Now we shan't have to talk,' he said. "'smiling into her candid eyes "'as they floated away "'on the soft waves of the blue Danube. "'She made no answer. "'Her lips trembled into a smile, "'but the eyes remained distant and serious "'as if bent on some ineffable vision. "'Dear,' Archer whispered, "'pressing her to him, it was borne in on him that the first hours of being engaged, even if spent in a ballroom, had in them something grave and sacramental. What a new life it was going to be, with this whiteness, radiance, goodness at one side. The dance over the two, as became an affianced couple, wandered into the conservatory and, sitting behind a tall screen of tree-ferns and camellias, Newland pressed her gloved hand to his lips. "'You see, I did as you asked me to,' she said. "'Yes, I couldn't wait,' he answered, smiling. After a moment he added, "'Only I wish it hadn't had to be at a ball.' Yes, I know, she met his glance comprehendingly, but, after all, even here we're alone together, aren't we? Oh, dearest, always, Archer cried. Evidently she was always going to understand. She was always going to say the right thing. The discovery made the cup of his bliss overflow, and he went on gaily, the worst of it is that I want to kiss you, and I can't. As he spoke, he took a swift glance about the conservatory, assured himself of their momentary privacy, and, catching her to him, laid a fugitive pressure on her lips. To counteract the audacity of this proceeding, he led her to a bamboo sofa in a less secluded part of the conservatory, and, sitting down beside her, broke a lily of the valley away from her bouquet. 
She sat silent, and the world lay like a sunlit valley at their feet. "'Did you tell my cousin Ellen?' she asked presently, as if she spoke through a dream. He roused himself and remembered that he had not done so. Some invincible repugnance to speak of such things to the strange foreign woman had checked the words on his lips. "'No, I haven't the chance after all,' he said, fibbing hastily. "'Oh, she looked disappointed, but gently resolved on gaining her point. "'You must, then, for I didn't either, and I shouldn't like her to think, of course not. "'But aren't you, after all, the person to do it?' "'She pondered on this. "'If I'd done it at the right time, yes. "'But now that there's been a delay, I think you must explain that— I'd asked you to tell her at the opera, before our speaking about it to everybody here. Otherwise, she might think I had forgotten her. You see, she's one of the family, and she's been away so long that she's rather sensitive. Archer looked at her glowingly. Dear and great angel, of course I'll tell her. He glanced a trifle apprehensively around the crowded ballroom. But I haven't seen her yet. "'Has she come?' "'No, at the last minute she decided not to. "'At the last minute,' he echoed, "'betraying his surprise that she should ever have considered the alternative possible. "'Yes, she's awfully fond of dancing,' the young woman answered simply. "'But suddenly she made up her mind that her dress wasn't smart enough for a ball, "'though we thought it so lovely, and so my aunt had to take her home.' "'Oh, well,' said Archer, with happy indifference. "'Nothing about his betrothed pleased him more "'than her resolute determination "'to carry to its utmost limit "'that ritual of ignoring the unpleasant "'in which they had both been brought up. "'She knows as well as I do,' he reflected, "'the real reason of her cousin staying away. "'But I shall never let her see, by the least sign,' that I am conscious of there being a shadow of a shade on poor Ellen Olenska's reputation. End of chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. THE AGE OF INNOCENCE A NOVEL BY EDITH WHARTON READ FOR LIBRIVOX BY BRENDA DANE CHAPTER Four. In the course of the next day the first of the usual betrothal visits were exchanged. The New York ritual was precise and inflexible in such matters, and in conformity with it Newland Archer went, first with his mother and sister, to call on Mrs. Welland, after which he and Mrs. Welland and May drove out to old Mrs. Manson Mingott's to receive that venerable ancestress's blessing. A visit to Mrs. Manson Mingott was always an amusing episode to the young man. The house in itself was already an historic document, though not, of course, as venerable as certain other old family houses in University Place and Lower Fifth Avenue. Those were of the purest, 1830, with a grim harmony of cabbage-rose garlanded carpets, rosewood consoles, round-arched fireplaces with marble-black mantles, and immense glazed bookcases of mahogany. Whereas old Mrs. Mingott, who had built her house later, had bodily cast out the massive furniture of her prime, and mingled with the Mingott heirlooms the frivolous upholstery of the Second Empire. It was in her habit to sit in a window of the sitting-room on the ground floor, as if watching calmly for life and fashion to flow northward to her solitary doors. She seemed in no hurry to have them come, for her patience was equalled by her confidence. She was sure that, presently, the hoardings, the quarries, the one-story saloons, the wooden greenhouses and ragged gardens, and the rocks from which goats surveyed the scene, 
would vanish before the advances of residences as stately as her own, perhaps, for she was an impartial woman, even statelier, and that the cobblestones over which the old clattering omnibuses bumped would be replaced by smooth asphalt, such as people reported having seen in Paris. Meanwhile, as everyone she cared to see came to her, and she could fill her rooms as easily as the Beauforts, and without adding a single item to the menu of her suppers, she did not suffer from her geographic isolation. The immense accretion of flesh, which had descended on her in middle life like a flood of lava on a doomed city, had changed her from a plump, active little woman with a neatly turned foot and ankle into something as vast and august as a natural phenomenon. She had accepted this submergence as philosophically as all her other trials, and now, in extreme old age, was rewarded by presenting to her mirror an almost unwrinkled expanse of firm pink-and-white flesh, in the center of which the traces of a small face survived, as if awaiting excavation. A flight of smooth double chins led down to the dizzy depths of a still snowy bosom, veiled in snowy muslins that were held in place by a miniature portrait of the late Mr. Mingott. And around and below, wave after wave of black silk surged away over the edges of a capacious armchair, with two tiny white hands poised like gulls on the surface of the billows. The burden of Mrs. Manson Mingott's flesh had long since made it impossible for her to go up and down stairs, and with characteristic independence she had made her reception rooms upstairs and established herself, in flagrant violation of all the New York proprieties, on the ground floor of her house, so that as you sat in her sitting-room window with her you caught through a door that was always open, and a looped-back yellow damask portiere, the unexpected vista of a bedroom with a huge low bed upholstered like a sofa, and a toilet table with frivolous lace flounces and a gilt-framed mirror. Her visitors were startled and fascinated by the foreignness of this arrangement, which recalled scenes in French fiction— and architectural incentives to immorality such as the simple American had never dreamed of. That was how women with lovers lived in the wicked old societies, in apartments with all the rooms on one floor and all the indecent propinquities that their novels described. It amused Newland Archer, who had secretly situated the love scenes of Monsieur de Camor in Mrs. Mingott's bedroom, to picture her blameless life led in this stage setting of adultery. But he said to himself, with considerable admiration, that if a lover had been what she had wanted, the intrepid woman would have had him too. To the general relief, the Countess Olenska was not present in her grandmother's drawing-room during the visit of the betrothed couple. Mrs. Mingott said she had gone out, which, on a day of such glaring sunlight— and at the shopping hour, seemed in itself an indelicate thing for a compromised woman to do. But at any rate it spared them the embarrassment of her presence, and the faint shadow that her unhappy past might seem to shed on their radiant future. The visit went off successfully, as was to have been expected. Old Mrs. Mingott was delighted with the engagement which, being long foreseen by watchful relatives, had been carefully passed upon in family council. And the engagement ring, a large, thick sapphire, set in invisible claws, met with her unqualified admiration. It's the new setting. Of course, it shows the stone beautifully, but it looks a little bare to old-fashioned eyes, Mrs. Welland had explained, with a conciliatory side-glance at her future son-in-law. "'Old-fashioned eyes? I hope you don't mean mine, my dear. I like all the novelties,' said the ancestress, 
lifting the stone to her small, bright orbs, which no glasses had ever disfigured. "'Very handsome,' she added, returning the jewel. "'Very liberal. "'In my time a cameo set in pearls was thought sufficient, "'but it's the hand that sets off the ring, isn't it, my dear Mr. Archer?' "'And she waved one of her tiny hands, with small, pointed nails, "'and rolls of aged fat encircling the wrist like ivory bracelets. "'Mine was modelled in Rome by the great Ferengiani. "'You should have May's done.' "'No doubt he'll have it done, my child. "'Her hand is large. "'It's these modern sports that spread the joints. "'But the skin is white. "'And when's the wedding to be?' "'She broke off, fixing her eyes on Archer's face. "'Oh,' Mrs. Welland murmured, "'while the young man, smiling at his betrothed, replied, "'As soon as ever it can, "'if only you'll back me up, Mrs. Mingott. "'We must give them time to get to know each other "'a little better, Mamma. Mrs. Welland interposed, with the proper affectation of reluctance, to which the ancestress rejoined, "'Know each other? Fiddlesticks! Everybody in New York has always known everybody. Let the young man have his way, my dear. Don't wait till the bubble's off the wine. Marry them before Lent. I may catch pneumonia any winter now, and I want to give the wedding breakfast.' These successive statements were received— with the proper expressions of amusement, incredulity, and gratitude. And the visit was breaking up in a vein of mild pleasantry when the door opened to admit the Countess Olenska, who entered in bonnet and mantle, followed by the unexpected figure of Julius Beaufort. There was a cousinly murmur of pleasure between the ladies, and Mrs. Mingott held out Ferengiani's model to the banker, "'Ah, Beaufort, this is a rare favor. "'She had an odd, foreign way of addressing men by their surnames. "'Thanks. I wish it might happen oftener,' said the visitor, "'in his easy, arrogant way. "'I'm generally so tied down, but I met the Countess Ellen in Madison Square, "'and she was good enough to let me walk home with her. "'Oh, I hope the house will be gayer now that Ellen's here,' "'cried Mrs. Mingott with glorious effrontery. "'Sit down, sit down, Beaufort. Push up the yellow armchair. Now I've got you, I want a good gossip. I hear your ball was magnificent, and I understand you invited Mrs. Lemuel Struthers. Well, I've a curiosity to see the woman myself.' She had forgotten her relatives, who were drifting out into the hall under Ellen Olenska's guidance. Old Mrs. Mingott had always professed a great admiration for Julius Beaufort, and there was a kind of kinship in their cool, domineering way, and their shortcuts through the conventions. Now she was eagerly curious to know what had decided the Beauforts to invite, for the first time, Mrs. Lemuel Struthers, the widow of Struthers' shoe polish, who had returned the previous year from a long initiatory sojourn to Europe to lay siege to the tight little citadel of New York. "'Of course, if you and Regina invite her, the thing is settled. "'Well, we need new blood and new money, and I hear she's still very good-looking,' "'the carnivorous old lady declared. "'In the hall, while Mrs. Welland and May drew on their furs, "'Archer saw that the Countess Olenska was looking at him with a faintly questioning smile. "'Of course you know already about May and me,' he said. "'answering her look with a shy laugh. "'She scolded me for not giving you the news last night at the opera. "'I had her orders to tell you that we were engaged, "'but I couldn't in that crowd.' "'The smile passed from Countess Olenska's eyes to her lips. "'She looked younger, more like the bold, brown Ellen Mingott of his boyhood. "'Of course I know, yes, and I am so glad, "'but one doesn't tell such things first in a crowd.' The ladies were on the threshold, and she held out her hand. "'Good-bye. Come and see me some day,' she said, still looking at Archer. In the carriage, on the way down Fifth Avenue, they talked pointedly of Mrs. Mingott, of her age, her spirit, and all her wonderful attributes. No one alluded to Ellen Olenska, but Archer knew that Mrs. Welland was thinking— it's a mistake for Ellen to be seen. 
the very day after her arrival, parading up Fifth Avenue at the crowded hours with Julius Beaufort. And the young man himself mentally added, And she ought to know that a man who's just engaged doesn't spend his time calling on married women. But I dare say it's the set she's lived in they do. They never do anything else. And in spite of the cosmopolitan views on which he prided himself, he thanked heaven that he was a New Yorker, and about to ally himself with one of his own kind. End of chapter 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 5 The next evening old Mr. Sillerton Jackson came to dine with the archers. Mrs. Archer was a shy woman, and shrank from society. But she liked to be well informed as to its doings. Her old friend, Mr. Sillerton Jackson, applied to the investigation of his friend's affairs, the patience of a collector and the science of a naturalist. And his sister, Miss Sophie Jackson, who lived with him and was entertained by all the people who could not secure her much-sought-after brother, brought home bits of minor gossip that filled in usefully the gaps in his picture. Therefore, whenever anything happened that Mrs. Archer wanted to know about, she asked Mr. Jackson to dine and as she honored few people with her invitations, and as she and her daughter Janie were an excellent audience, Mr. Jackson usually came himself instead of sending his sister. If he could have dictated all the conditions, he would have chosen the evenings when Newland was out. Not because the young man was uncongenial to him. The two got on capitally at the club but because the old anecdotist sometimes felt, on Newland's part, a tendency to weigh his evidence that the ladies of the family never showed. Mr. Jackson, if perfection had been attainable on earth, would also have asked that Mrs. Archer's food should be a little better. But then New York, as far back as the mind of man could travel, had been divided into the two great fundamental groups of the Mingotts and the Mansons, and all their clan, who cared about eating and clothes and money, and the Archer, Newland, van der Luyden tribe, who were devoted to travel, horticulture, and the best fiction, and looked down on the grosser forms of pleasure. You couldn't have everything after all. If you dined with the Lovell Mingotts, you got canvas back and terrapin and vintage wines. At Adelaide Archer's, you could talk about alpine scenery and the marble fawn, and, luckily, the Archer Madeira had gone round the Cape. Therefore, when a friendly summons came from Mrs. Archer, Mr. Jackson, who was a true eclectic, would usually say to his sister, "'I've been a little gouty since my last dinner at the Lovell Mingotts. It'll do me good to dine at Adeline's.' Mrs. Archer, who had long been a widow, lived with her son and daughter in West 28th Street. An upper floor was dedicated to Newland, and the two women squeezed themselves into narrower quarters below. In an unclouded harmony of tastes and interests, they cultivated ferns in Wardian cases, made macrame lace and wool embroidery on linen, collected American revolutionary glazed ware, subscribed to good words, and read Ouida's novels for the sake of the Italian atmosphere. They preferred those about peasant life, because of the descriptions of scenery and the pleasanter sentiments, though in general they liked novels about people in society, whose motives and habits were more comprehensible. Spoke severely of Dickens, who had never drawn a gentleman, and considered Thackeray less at home in the great world than Bulwer, who, 
however, was beginning to be thought old-fashioned. Mrs. and Miss Archer were both great lovers of scenery. It was what they principally sought and admired on their occasional travels abroad, considering architecture and painting as subjects for men, and chiefly for learned persons who read Ruskin. Mrs. Archer had been born a Newland, and mother and daughter, who were as like as sisters, were both, as people said, true Newlands, tall, pale, and slightly round-shouldered, with long noses, sweet smiles, and a kind of drooping distinction like that in certain faded Reynolds portraits. Their physical resemblance would have been complete if an elderly embonpoint had not stretched Mrs. Archer's black brocade, while Miss Archer's brown and purple poplins hung, as the years went on, more and more slackly on her virgin frame. Mentally the likeness between them, as Newland was aware, was less complete than their identical mannerisms often made it appear. The long habit of living together in mutually dependent intimacy had given them the same vocabulary, and the same habit of beginning their phrases, Mother thinks, or Janie thinks, according as one or the other wished to advance an opinion of her own. But in reality, while Mrs. Archer's serene unimaginativeness rested easily in the accepted and familiar, Janie was subject to starts and aberrations of fancy, welling up from springs of suppressed romance. Mother and daughter adored each other, and revered their son and brother. And Archer loved them, with a tenderness made compunctious and uncritical, by the sense of their exaggerated admiration and by his secret satisfaction in it. After all, he thought it a good thing for a man to have his authority respected in his own house, even if his sense of humor sometimes made him question the force of his mandate. On this occasion, the young man was very sure that Mr. Jackson would rather have had him dine out, but he had his own reasons for not doing so. Of course, old Jackson wanted to talk about Ellen Olenska, and, of course, Mrs. Archer and Janey wanted to hear what he had to tell. All three would be slightly embarrassed by Newland's presence, now that his prospective relation to the Mingott's clan had been made known. And the young man waited with an amused curiosity to see how they would turn the difficulty. They began, obliquely, by talking about Mrs. Lemuel Struthers. It's a pity the Beauforts asked her, Mrs. Archer said gently, but then Regina always does what he tells her, and Beaufort, certain nuances, escape, Beaufort, said Mr. Jackson, cautiously inspecting the broiled shad, and wondering for the thousandth time why Mrs. Archer's cook always burnt the roe to a cinder. Newland, who had long shared his wonder, could always detect in it the older man's expression of melancholy disapproval. Oh, necessarily, Beaufort is a vulgar man, said Mrs. Archer. My grandfather Newland always used to say to my mother, Whatever you do, don't let that fellow Beaufort be introduced to the girls. But at least he's had the advantage of associating with gentlemen. In England, too, they say. It's all very mysterious. She glanced at Janie and paused. She and Janie knew every fold of the Beaufort mystery— but in public, Mrs. Archer continued to assume that the subject was not one for the unmarried. But this Mrs. Struthers, Mrs. Archer continued, what did you say she was, Sillerton? Out of a mine, or rather out of a saloon at the head of the pit, and then living waxworks, touring New England. After the police broke that up, they say she lived. Mr. Jackson, in his turn, glanced at Janey whose eyes began to bulge from under her prominent lids. There were still hiatuses for her in Mrs. Struthers' past. Then, Mr. Jackson continued, and Archer saw he was wondering why no one had told the butler 
never to slice cucumbers with a steel knife. Then Lemuel Struthers came along. They say his advertiser used the girl's head for the shoe polish posters. Her hair's intensely black, you know, the Egyptian style. Anyhow, he eventually married her. There were volumes of innuendo in the way the eventually was spaced, and each syllable was given its due stress. Oh, well, at the pass we've come to nowadays, it doesn't matter, said Mrs. Archer indifferently. The ladies were not really interested in Mrs. Struthers just then. The subject of Ellen Olenska was too fresh and too absorbing to them. Indeed, Mrs. Struthers' name had been introduced by Mrs. Archer only that she might presently be able to say, And Newland's new cousin, Countess Olenska, was she at the ball, too? There was a faint touch of sarcasm in the reference to her son, and Archer knew it and had expected it. Even Mrs. Archer, who was seldom unduly pleased with human events, had been altogether glad of her son's engagement, especially after that silly business with Mrs. Rushworth, as she had remarked to Janey, alluding to what had once seemed to Newland a tragedy of which his soul would always bear the scar. There was no better match in New York than May Welland. Look at the question from whatever point you chose. Of course, such a marriage was only what Newland was entitled to. But young men are so foolish and incalculable, and some women so ensnaring and unscrupulous, that it was nothing short of a miracle to see one's only son safe past the siren isle and in the haven of a blameless domesticity. All this Mrs. Archer felt, and her son knew she felt. But he knew also that she had been perturbed by the premature announcement of his engagement, or rather, by its cause. And it was for that reason, because on the whole he was a tender and indulgent master, that he stayed at home that evening. It's not that I don't approve of the Mingott's esprit de corps, but why Newland's engagement should be mixed up with that Olenska woman's comings and goings, I don't see, Mrs. Archer grumbled to Janey, the only witness of her slight lapses from perfect sweetness. She had behaved beautifully, and in beautiful behavior she was unsurpassed during the call on Mrs. Welland. But Newland knew and his betrothed, doubtless guessed, that all through the visit she and Janey were nervously on the watch for Madame Olenska's possible intrusion. And when they left the house together, she had permitted herself to say to her son, I am thankful that Augusta Welland received us alone. These indications of inward disturbance moved Archer the more that he too felt the Mingots had gone a little too far. But, as it was against all the rules of their code that the mother and son should ever allude to what was uppermost in their thoughts, he simply replied, "'Oh, well, there's always a phase of family parties to be gone through when one gets engaged, and the sooner it's over, the better.' At which his mother merely pursed her lips, under the lace veil that hung down from her grey velvet bonnet, trimmed with frosted grapes." Her revenge, he felt, her lawful revenge, would be to draw Mr. Jackson that evening on the Countess Olenska, and, having publicly done his duty as a future member of the Mingott clan, the young man had no objection to hearing the lady discussed in private, except that the subject was already beginning to bore him. Mr. Jackson had helped himself to a slice of the tepid fillet which the mournful butler had handed him with a look as skeptical as his own, and had rejected the mushroom sauce after a scarcely perceptible sniff. He looked baffled and hungry, and Archer reflected that he would probably finish his meal on Ellen Olenska. Mr. Jackson leaned back in his chair and glanced up at the candlelit Archer's, Newland's, and Vanderloyden's hanging in dark frames on the dark walls. 
Ah, how your grandfather Archer loved a good dinner, my dear Newland, he said, his eyes on the portrait of a plump, full-chested young man in a stock and a blue coat, with a view of a white-columned country house behind him. Well, well, well. I wonder what he would have said to all these foreign marriages. Mr. Archer ignored the allusion to the ancestral cuisine, and Mr. Jackson continued with deliberation. No, she was not at the ball. Ah, Mrs. Archer murmured in a tone that implied she had that decency. Perhaps the Beauforts don't know her, Janey suggested, with artless malice. Mr. Jackson gave a faint sip, as if he had been tasting invisible Madeira. Mrs. Beaufort may not, but Beaufort certainly does, for she was seen walking up Fifth Avenue this afternoon with him by the whole of New York. Mercy, moaned Mrs. Archer, evidently perceiving the uselessness of trying to ascribe the actions of foreigners to a sense of delicacy. I wonder if she wears a round hat or a bonnet in the afternoon, Janie speculated. At the opera, I know she had on a dark blue velvet, perfectly plain and flat, like a nightgown. Janie, said her mother, and Miss Archer blushed and tried to look audacious. It was, at any rate, in better taste not to go to the ball, Mrs. Archer continued. A spirit of perversity moved her son to rejoin. I don't think it was a question of taste with her. May said she meant to go and then decided that the dress in question wasn't smart enough. Mrs. Archer smiled at this confirmation of her inference. Poor Ellen, she simply remarked adding compassionately, we must always bear in mind what an eccentric bring-up Medora Manson gave her. What can you expect of a girl who was allowed to wear black satin at her coming-out ball? Ah, I don't remember her in it, said Mr. Jackson, adding, poor girl, in the tone of one who, while enjoying the memory, had fully understood at the time what the sight portended. It's odd, Janey remarked, that she should have kept such an ugly name as Ellen. I should have changed it to Elaine. She glanced about the table to see the effect of this. Her brother laughed. Why Elaine? I don't know. It sounds more... more Polish, said Janey, blushing. It sounds more conspicuous, and that can hardly be what she wishes, said Mrs. Archer distantly. Why not? broke in her son, growing suddenly argumentative. Why shouldn't she be conspicuous if she chooses? Why should she slink about as if it were she who had disgraced herself? She's a poor Ellen, certainly, because she had the bad luck to make a wretched marriage. But I don't see but that's a reason for hiding her head as if she were the culprit. That, I suppose, said Mr. Jackson, speculatively, is the line the Mingotts mean to take. The young man reddened. I don't have to wait for their cue, if that's what you mean, sir. Madame Olenska has had an unhappy life. That doesn't make her an outcast. There are rumors, began Mr. Jackson, glancing at Janie. Oh, I know. The secretary, the young man took him up. Nonsense, mother. Janie's a grown-up. They say, don't they, he went on, that the secretary helped her to get away from her brute of a husband— who kept her practically a prisoner. They say, don't they, that the secretary helped her to get away from her brute of a husband, who kept her practically a prisoner. Well, what if he did? I hope there isn't a man among us who wouldn't have done the same thing in such a case. Mr. Jackson glanced over his shoulder to say to the sad little butler, Perhaps that sauce, just a little, after all. Then, having helped himself, he remarked, "'I'm told she's looking for a house. She means to live here.' "'I hear she means to get a divorce,' said Janey boldly. "'I hope she will,' Archer exclaimed. The word had fallen like a bombshell in the pure and tranquil atmosphere of the Archer dining-room. 
Mrs. Archer raised her delicate eyebrows in the particular curve that signified the butler, and the young man, himself mindful of the bad taste in discussing such intimate manners in public, hastily branched off into an account of his visit to old Mrs. Mingott. After dinner, according to immemorial custom, Mrs. Archer and Janey trailed their long silk draperies up to the drawing-room, where, while the gentlemen smoked below stairs, they sat beside a carcel lamp with an engraved globe, facing each other across a rosewood work-table with a green silk bag under it, and stitched at the two ends of a tapestry band of field flowers destined to adorn an occasional chair in the drawing-room of young Mrs. Newland Archer. While this rite was in progress in the drawing-room, Archer settled Mr. Jackson in an armchair near the fire in the Gothic library and handed him a cigar. Mr. Jackson sank into the armchair with satisfaction, lit his cigar with perfect confidence, it was Newland who bought them, and stretching his thin old ankles to the coals, said, "'You say the secretary merely helped her to get away, my dear fellow?' Well, he was still helping her a year later then, for somebody met him living at Lausanne together. Newland reddened. Living together? Well, why not? Who had the right to make her life over if she hadn't? I am sick of the hypocrisy that would bury alive a woman of her age if her husband prefers to live with harlots. He stopped and turned away angrily to light his cigar. "'Women ought to be free, as free as we are,' he declared, making a discovery of which he was too irritated to measure the terrific consequences. Mr. Sillerton Jackson stretched his ankles near the coals and emitted a sardonic whistle. "'Well,' he said after a pause, Apparently Count Olensky takes your view, for I never heard of his having lifted a finger to get his wife back. End of chapter 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 6 That evening, after Mr. Jackson had taken himself away, and the ladies had retired to their chintz curtain bedroom, Newland Archer mounted thoughtfully to his own study. A vigilant hand had, as usual, kept the fire alive and the lamp trimmed and the room, with its rows and rows of books, its bronze and steel statuettes of the fencers on the mantelpiece, and its many photographs of famous pictures, looked homelike and welcoming. As he dropped into his armchair near the fire, his eyes rested on a large photograph of May Welland, which the young girl had given him in the first days of their romance, and which had now displaced all the other portraits on the table. With a new sense of awe, he looked at the frank forehead, serious eyes, and gay, innocent mouth of the young creature whose soul's custodian he was to be. That terrifying product of the social system he belonged to, and believed in, the young girl who knew nothing, and expected everything, looked back at him, like a stranger, through May Wellen's familiar features and once more it was borne in on him that marriage was not the safe anchorage he had been taught to think, but a voyage on uncharted seas. The case of the Countess Olenska had stirred up old, settled convictions and set them drifting dangerously through his mind. His own exclamation, Women should be free, as free as we are struck to the root of a problem that it was agreed in his world to regard as non-existent. Nice women, however wronged, would never claim the kind of freedom he meant, 
and generous-minded men like himself were therefore, in the heat of argument, the more chivalrously ready to concede it to them. Such verbal generosities were, in fact, only a humbugging disguise of the inexorable conventions that tied things together and bound people down to the old pattern. But here he was, pledged to defend on the part of his betrothed's cousin, conduct that, on his own wife's part, would justify him in calling down on her all the thunders of church and state. Of course, the dilemma was purely hypothetical. Since he wasn't a blackguard Polish nobleman, it was absurd to speculate what his wife's rights would be if he were. But Newland Archer was too imaginative not to feel that, in his case and May's, the tie might gall for reasons far less gross and palpable. What could he and she really know of each other, since it was his duty as a decent fellow to conceal his past from her, and hers, as a marriageable girl, to have no past to conceal? What if, for some one of the subtler reasons that would tell with both of them, they should tire of each other, misunderstand or irritate each other. He reviewed his friends' marriages, the supposedly happy ones, and saw none that answered even remotely to the passionate and tender comradeship which he pictured as his permanent relation with May Welland. He perceived that such a picture presupposed, on her part, the experience, the versatility, the freedom of judgment— which she had been carefully trained not to possess. And with a shiver of foreboding, he saw his marriage becoming what most of the other marriages about him were, a dull association of material and social interests, held together by ignorance on the one side and hypocrisy on the other. Lawrence Lefferts occurred to him as the husband who had most completely realized this enviable ideal. As became the high priest of form, he had formed a wife so completely to his own convenience that, in the most conspicuous moments of his frequent love affairs with other men's wives, she went about in smiling unconsciousness, saying that Lawrence was so frightfully strict, and had been known to blush indignantly and avert her gaze when someone alluded in her presence to the fact that Julius Beaufort, as became a foreigner of doubtful origin, had what was known in New York as another establishment. Archer tried to console himself with the thought that he was not quite such an ass as Larry Lefferts, nor May such a simpleton as poor Gertrude. But the difference was, after all, one of intelligence and not of standards. In reality, they all lived in a kind of hieroglyphic world, where the real thing was never said, or done, or even thought, but only represented by a set of arbitrary signs, as when Mrs. Welland, who knew exactly why Archer had pressed her to announce her daughter's engagement at the Beaufort Ball, and had indeed expected him to do no less, yet felt obliged to simulate reluctance and the air of having her hand forced, quite as in the books on primitive man that people of advanced cultures were beginning to read, the savage bride is dragged with shrieks from her parents' tent. The result, of course, was that the young girl, who was the center of this elaborate system of mystification, remained the more inscrutable for her very frankness and assurance. She was frank, poor darling, because she had nothing to conceal. Assured, because she knew of nothing to be on her guard against, and with no better preparation than this, she was to be plunged overnight into what people evasively called the facts of life. The young man was sincerely, but placidly, in love. He delighted in the radiant good looks of his betrothed, in her health, her horsemanship, her grace and quickness at games— and the shy interest in books and ideas that she was beginning to develop under his guidance. She had advanced far enough to join him in ridiculing the idols of the king, 
but not to feel the beauty of Ulysses and the Lotus Eaters. She was straightforward, loyal, and brave. She had a sense of humor, chiefly proved by her laughing at his jokes, and he suspected, in the depths of her innocently gazing soul, a glow of feeling that it would be a joy to waken. But when he had gone the brief round of her, he returned discouraged by the thought that all this frankness and innocence were only an artificial product. Untrained human nature was not frank and innocent. It was full of the twists and defenses of an instinctive guile. And he felt himself oppressed by this creation of facetious purity, so cunningly manufactured by a conspiracy of mothers and aunts and grandmothers and long-dead ancestresses, because it was supposed to be what he wanted, what he had a right to, in order that he might exercise his lordly pleasure in smashing it like an image made of snow. There was a certain triteness in these reflections. They were those habitual to young men on the approach of their wedding day. But they were generally accompanied by a sense of compunction and self-abasement of which Newland Archer felt no trace. He could not deplore as Thackeray's heroes so often exasperated him by doing, that he had not a blank page to offer his bride in exchange for the unblemished one she was to give to him. He could not get away from the fact that if he had been brought up as she had, they would have been no more fit to find their way about than the babes in the wood. Nor could he, for all his anxious cogitations, see any honest reason, that is, unconnected with his own momentary pleasure and the passion of masculine vanity, why his bride should not have been allowed the same freedom of experience as himself. Such questions, at such an hour, were bound to drift through his mind, but he was conscious that their uncomfortable persistence and precision were due to the inopportune arrival of the Countess Olenska. Here he was, at the very moment of his betrothal, a moment for pure thoughts and cloudless hopes, pitchforked into a coil of scandal, which raised all the special problems he could have preferred to let lie. Hang Ellen Olenska, he grumbled, as he covered his fire and began to undress. He could not really see why her fate should have the least bearing on his yet he dimly felt that he had only just begun to measure the risks of the championship which his engagement had forced upon him. A few days later, the bolt fell. The Lovell Mingotts had sent out cards for what was known as a formal dinner, that is, three extra footmen, two dishes for each course, and a Roman punch in the middle, and had headed their invitations with the words, to meet the Countess Olenska, in accordance with the hospitable American fashion, which treats strangers as if they were royalty, or at least as their ambassadors. The guests had been selected with a boldness and discrimination in which the initiated recognized the firm hand of Catherine the Great. Associated with such immemorial standbys as the Selfridge Marys, who were asked everywhere because they always had been, the Beauforts, on whom there was a claim of relationship, and Mr. Sillerton Jackson and his sister Sophie, who went wherever her brother told her to, were some of the most fashionable and yet most irreproachable of the dominant young married set. The Lawrence Leffertsies, Mrs. Lefferts Rushworth, the lovely widow, the Harry Thorleys, the Reggie Chiverses, and young Morris Dagonet and his wife, who was a van der Luyden. The company, indeed, was perfectly assorted, since all the members belonged to the little inner group of people who, during the long New York season, disported themselves together daily and nightly with apparently undiminished zest. Forty-eight hours later, the unbelievable had happened. Everyone had refused the Mingott's invitation, except the Beauforts, and old Mr. Jackson and his sister. 
The intended slight was emphasized by the fact that even the Reggie Chiverses, who were of the Mingott clan, were among those inflicting it, and by the uniform wording of the notes, in all of which the writers regretted that they were unable to accept, without the mitigating plea of a previous engagement that ordinary courtesy prescribed. New York society was, in those days, far too small and too scant in its resources, for everyone in it, including livery stable keepers, butlers, and cooks, not to know exactly on which evenings people were free. And it was thus possible for the recipients of Mrs. Lovell Mingott's invitations to make cruelly clear their determination not to meet the Countess Olenska. The blow was unexpected, but the Mingotts, as their way was, met it gallantly. Mrs. Lovell Mingott confided the case to Mrs. Welland, who confided it to Newland Archer, who, aflame at the outrage, appealed passionately and authoritatively to his mother, who, after a painful period of inward resistance and outward temporizing, succumbed to his instances, as she always did, and immediately embracing his cause with an energy redoubled by her previous hesitations, put on her grey velvet bonnet and said, I'll go and see Louisa van der Luyden. The New York of Newland Archer's Day was a small and slippery pyramid, in which, as yet, hardly a fissure had been made or a foothold gained. At its base was a firm foundation of what Mrs. Archer called plain people, an honorable but obscure majority of respectable families who, as in the case of the Spicers, or the Leffertsies, or the Jacksons, had been raised above their level by marriage with one of the ruling clans. People, Mrs. Archer always said, were not as particular as they used to be, and with old Catherine Spicer ruling one end of Fifth Avenue, and Julius Beaufort the other, you couldn't expect the old traditions to last much longer. Firmly narrowing upward from the wealthy but inconspicuous substratum was the compact and dominant group, which the Mingotts, Newlands, Chiverses, and Manson so actively represented. Most people imagined them to be the very apex of the pyramid, but they themselves, at least those of Mrs. Archer's generation, were aware that, in the eyes of the professional genealogist, only a still smaller number of families could claim that eminence. "'Don't tell me,' Mrs. Archer would say to her children, "'all this modern newspaper rubbish about a New York aristocracy. "'If there is one, neither the Mingotts nor the Mansons belong to it, "'no, nor the Newlands or the Chiverses either. "'Our grandfathers and great-grandfathers "'were just respectable English or Dutch merchants, "'who came to the colonies to make their fortune and stayed "'because they did so well. "'One of your grandfathers signed the Declaration.' and another was a general on Washington's staff. These are things to be proud of, but they have nothing to do with rank or class. New York has always been a commercial community, and there are not more than three families in it who can claim an aristocratic origin in the real sense of the word. Mrs. Archer and her son and daughter, like everyone else in New York, knew who these privileged beings were, the Dagonets of Washington Square, who came of an old English county family, allied with the Pitts and the Foxes. The Lannings, who had intermarried with the descendants of Count de Grasse. And the Van Deloydens, direct descendants of the first Dutch governor of Manhattan, and related, by pre-revolutionary marriages, to several members of the French and British aristocracy. The Lannings survived only in the person of two very old but lively Miss Lannings, who lived cheerfully and reminiscently among family portraits and Chippendale. The Dagonets were a considerable clan, allied to the best names in Baltimore and Philadelphia, but the Van der Luydens, who stood above all of them, had faded into a kind of superterrestrial twilight from which only two figures impressively emerged, 
those of Mr. and Mrs. Henry van der Luyden. Mrs. Henry van der Luyden had been Louisa Dagonet, and her mother had been the grandmother of Colonel de Lac, of an old Channel Island family, who had fought under Cornwallis and had settled in Maryland after the war, with his bride, Lady Angelica Trevenna, fifth daughter of the Earl of St. Austry. The tie between the Dagonets, the Dulacs of Maryland, and their aristocratic Cornish kinfolk, the Trevenas, had always remained close and cordial. Mr. and Mrs. van der Luyden had more than once paid long visits to the present head of the House of Trevenna, the Duke of St. Austry, at his county seat in Cornwall, and at St. Austry in Gloucestershire, and his grace had frequently announced his intention of some day returning their visit without the Duchess, who feared the Atlantic. Mr. and Mrs. van der Luyden divided their time between Trevenna, their place in Maryland, and their great estate on the Hudson, which had been one of the colonial grants of the Dutch government to the famous first governor, and of which Mr. van der Luyden was still patroon. Their large, solemn house in Madison Avenue was seldom opened, and when they came to town they received in it only their most intimate friends. "'I wish you would go with me, Newland,' his mother said suddenly, pausing at the door of the brown coupé. Louisa is fond of you, and, of course, it's on account of dear May that I'm taking this step, and also because, if we don't all stand together, there'll be no such thing as society left. End of chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit www. Dot .librivox dot .org The Age of Innocence A novel by Edith Warden read for librivox by Brenda Dane Chapter 7 Mrs. Henry van der Luyden listened in silence to her cousin Mrs. Archer's narrative It was all very well to tell yourself in advance that Mrs. van der Luyden was always silent, and that, though non-committal by nature and training, she was very kind to those people she really liked. Even personal experience of these facts was not always a protection from the chill that descended on one in the high-ceilinged, white-walled Madison Avenue drawing-room, with the pale brocaded armchairs so obviously uncovered for the occasion, and the gauze still veiling the ormolu mantel ornaments, and the beautiful old carved frame of Gainsborough's Lady Angelica du Lac. Mrs. van der Luyden's portrait by Huntington, in black velvet and Venetian point, faced that of her lovely ancestress. It was generally considered as fine as a cabanel, and though twenty years had elapsed since its execution, was still a perfect likeness. Indeed, the Mrs. van der Luyden who sat beneath it, listening to Mrs. Archer, might have been the twin sister of the fair and still youngish woman drooping against a gilt armchair before a green rep curtain. Mrs. van der Luyden still wore black velvet and Venetian point when she went into society, or rather, since she never dined out, when she threw open her own doors to receive it. Her fair hair, which had faded without turning gray, was still parted in flat, overlapping points on her forehead, and the straight nose that divided her pale blue eyes was only a little more pinched about the nostrils than when the portrait had been painted. She always, indeed, struck Newland Archer as having been rather gruesomely preserved in the airless atmosphere of a perfectly irreproachable existence as bodies caught in glaciers keep for years a rosy life in death. Like all his family, he esteemed and admired Mrs. van der Luyden, but he found her gentle, bending sweetness less approachable than the grimness of some of his mother's old aunts, fierce spinsters who said no on principle before they knew what they were going to be asked. 
Mrs. van der Luyden's attitude said neither yes nor no, but always appeared to incline to clemency, till her thin lips, wavering into the shadow of a smile, made the almost invariable reply, I shall first have to talk this over with my husband. She and Mr. van der Luyden were so exactly alike that Archer often wondered how, after forty years of the closest conjugality, two such merged identities ever separated themselves enough for anything as controversial as a talking over. But as neither had ever reached a decision without prefacing it by this mysterious conclave, Mrs. Archer and her son, having set forth their case, waited resignedly for the familiar phrase. Mrs. van der Luyden, however, who had seldom surprised anyone, now surprised them by reaching her long hand towards the bell-rope. "'I think,' she said, "'I should like Henry to hear what you have told me.' A footman appeared, to whom she gravely added, "'If Mr. van der Luyden has finished reading the newspaper, "'please ask him to be kind enough to come.' She said, reading the newspaper, in a tone in which a minister's wife might have said, presiding at a cabinet meeting, not from any arrogance of mind, but because the habit of a lifetime, and the attitude of her friends and relations, had led her to consider Mr. van der Luyden's least gesture as having an almost sacerdotal importance. Her promptness of action showed that she considered the case as pressing as Mrs. Archer. But, lest she should be thought to have committed herself in advance, she added, with the sweetest look, Henry always enjoys seeing you, dear Adeline, and he will wish to congratulate Newland. The double doors had solemnly reopened, and between them appeared Mr. Henry van der Luyden, tall, spare, and frock-coated, with faded fair hair, a straight nose like his wife's, and the same look of frozen gentleness in eyes that were merely pale grey instead of pale blue. Mr. van der Luyden greeted Mrs. Archer with cousinly affability, preferred to Newland low-voiced congratulations couched in the same language as his wife's, and seated himself in one of the brocade armchairs, with the simplicity of a reigning sovereign. "'I had just finished reading The Times,' he said, laying his long fingertips together. "'In town my mornings are so much occupied that I find it more convenient to read the newspapers after luncheon.' "'Oh, there's a great deal to be said for that plan. Indeed, I think my Uncle Edgemont used to say he found it less agitating not to read the morning papers till after dinner.' said Mrs. Archer responsively. "'Yes, my good father abhorred hurry. But now we live in a constant rush,' said Mr. van der Luyden, in measured tones, looking with pleasant deliberation about the large, shrouded room, which to Archer was so complete an image of its owners. "'But I hope you had finished your reading, Henry,' his wife interposed. "'Quite, quite,' he reassured her. Then I should like Adeline to tell you, oh, it's really Newland's story, said his mother, smiling, and proceeded to rehearse once more the monstrous tale of the affront inflicted on Mrs. Lovell Mingott. Of course, she ended, Augusta Welland and Mary Mingott both felt that, especially in view of Newland's engagement, you and Henry ought to know. Ah! said Mr. van der Luyden, drawing a deep breath. There was a silence, during which the tick of the monumental ormolu clock on the white marble mantelpiece grew as loud as the boom of a minute gun. Archer contemplated with awe the two slender faded figures, seated side by side, in a kind of viceregal rigidity, mouthpieces of some remote ancestral authority 
which fate compelled them to wield, when they would so much rather have lived in simplicity and seclusion, digging invisible weeds out of the perfect lawns of Scoiter Cliff, and playing patience together in the evenings. Mr. van der Luyden was the first to speak. You really think this is due to some, some intentional interference of Lawrence Lefferts? he inquired, turning to Archer. I'm certain of it, sir. Larry has been going at it rather harder than usual lately, if Cousin Louisa won't mind my mentioning it, having a rather stiff affair with the postmaster's wife in their village or someone of that sort. And whenever poor Gertrude Lefferts begins to suspect anything, and he's afraid of trouble, he gets up a fuss of this kind to show how awfully moral he is, and talks at the top of his voice about the impertinence of inviting his wife to meet people he doesn't wish her to know. He's simply using Madame Olenska as a lightning rod. I've seen him try the same thing often before. "'The Leffertsies,' said Mrs. van der Luyden. "'The Leffertsies,' echoed Mrs. Archer. "'What would Uncle Edgemont have said of Lawrence Lefferts pronouncing on anybody's social position? It shows what society has come to.' "'Well, We'll hope it has not quite come to that, said Mr. van der Luyden firmly. Oh, if only you and Louisa went out more, sighed Mrs. Archer. But instantly she became aware of her mistake. The van der Luydens were morbidly sensitive to any criticism of their secluded existence. They were the arbiters of fashion, the court of last appeal, and they knew it, and bowed to their fate. But being shy and retiring persons, with no natural inclination for their part, they lived as much as possible in the sylvan solitude of Scoiter Cliff, and when they came to town declined all invitations on the plea of Mrs. van der Luyden's health. Newland Archer came to his mother's rescue. Everybody in New York knows what you and Cousin Louisa represent. That's why Mrs. Mingott felt she ought not to allow this slight on Countess Olenska to pass without consulting you. Mrs. van der Luyden glanced at her husband, who glanced back at her. It is the principle that I dislike, said Mr. van der Luyden. As long as a member of a well-known family is backed up by that family, it should be considered final. It seems so to me, said his wife, as if she were producing a new thought. I had no idea, Mr. van der Luyden continued, that things had come to such a pass. He paused and looked at his wife again. It occurs to me, my dear, that the Countess Olenska is already a sort of relation, through Medora Manson's first husband. At any rate, she will be when Newland marries. He turned towards the young man. "'Have you read this morning's Times, Newland?' "'Why, yes, sir,' said Archer, who usually tossed off half a dozen papers with his morning coffee. Husband and wife looked at each other again. Their pale eyes clung together in prolonged and serious consultation. Then a faint smile fluttered over Mrs. van der Luyden's face. She had evidently guessed and approved. Mr. van der Luyden turned to Mrs. Archer. If Louisa's health allowed her to dine out, I wish you would say to Mrs. Lovell Mingott, she and I would have been happy to fill the places of a Lawrence Leffertsies at her dinner. He paused to let the irony of this sink in. As you know, this is impossible, Mrs. Archer sounded a sympathetic assent. But Newland tells me he has read this morning's Times, therefore he has probably seen that Louisa's relative, the Duke of St. Austrie, arrives next week on the Russia. He is coming in to enter his new sloop, the Guinevere, in next summer's International Cup race, and also to have a little canvasback shooting at Trevenna. Mr. van der Luyden paused again, and continued with increasing benevolence. Before taking him down to Maryland— we are inviting a few friends to meet him here, only a little dinner, with a reception afterwards. 
I am sure Louisa will be as glad as I am if Countess Olenska will let us include her among our guests. He got up, bent his long body with a stiff friendliness towards his cousin, and added, I think I have Louisa's authority for saying that she will herself leave the invitation to dine when she drives out presently. With our cards, of course, with our cards. Mrs. Archer, who knew this to be a hint but the seventeen-hand chestnuts, which were never kept waiting, were at the door, rose with a hurried murmur of thanks. Mrs. van der Luyden beamed on her, but her husband raised a protesting hand. There is nothing to thank me for, dear Adeline, nothing at all. This kind of thing must not happen in New York. It shall not, as long as I can help it, he pronounced with sovereign gentleness as he steered his cousins to the door. Two hours later, everyone knew that the great sea-spring barouche in which Mrs. van der Luyden took the air at all seasons had been seen at old Mrs. Mingott's door, where a large, square envelope was handed in. And that evening, at the opera, Mr. Sillerton Jackson was able to state that the envelope contained a card inviting the Countess Olenska to the dinner which the Vanderloydens were giving the following week for their cousin, the Duke of St. Austry. Some of the younger men in the club box exchanged a smile at this announcement, and glanced sideways at Lawrence Lefferts, who sat carelessly in the front of the box, pulling his long, fair moustache, and who remarked with authority as the soprano paused, No one but Patty ought to attempt the somnambula. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 8 It was generally agreed in New York that the Countess Olenska had lost her looks. She had appeared there first in Newland Archer's boyhood, as a brilliantly pretty little girl of nine or ten, of whom people said that she ought to be painted. Her parents had been continental wanderers, and after a roaming babyhood she had lost them both and been taken in charge by her aunt, Medora Manson, also a wanderer who was herself returning to New York to settle down. Poor Medora, repeatedly widowed, was always coming home to settle down, each time in a less expensive house, and bringing with her a new husband or an adopted child. But after a few months, she invariably parted from her husband, or quarreled with her ward, and, having got rid of her house at a loss, set out again on her wanderings. As her mother had been a Rushworth, and her last unhappy marriage had linked her to one of the crazy Chiverses, New York looked indulgently on her eccentricities. But when she returned with her little orphaned niece, whose parents had been popular in spite of their regrettable taste for travel, people thought it a pity that the pretty child should be in such hands. Everyone was disposed to be kind to little Ellen Mingott, though her dusky red cheek and tight curls gave her an air of gaiety that seemed unsuitable in a child who should still have been in black for her parents. It was one of the misguided Medora's many peculiarities to flout the unalterable rules that regulated American mourning, and when she stepped from the steamer her family were scandalized to see that the crepe veil she wore for her own brother was seven inches shorter than those of her sisters-in-law, while little Ellen was in crimson merino and amber beads, like a gypsy foundling. But New York had so long resigned itself to Medora that only a few old ladies shook their heads over Ellen's gaudy clothes, while her other relations fell under the charm of her high color and high spirits. She was a fearless and familiar little thing who asked, disconcerting questions 
made precocious comments and possessed outlandish arts, such as dancing a Spanish shawl dance and singing Neapolitan love songs to a guitar. Under the direction of her aunt, whose real name was Mrs. Thorley Chivers, but who, having received a papal title, had resumed her first husband's patronomic, and called herself the Marchioness Manson, because in Italy she could turn it into Manzoni. The little girl received an expensive but incoherent education, which included drawing from the model, a thing never dreamed of before, and playing the piano in quintets with professional musicians. Of course, no good could come of this, and when a few years later poor Chivers finally died in a madhouse, his widow, draped in strange weeds, again pulled up stakes and departed with Ellen, who had grown into a tall, bony girl with conspicuous eyes. For some time no more was heard of them. Then news came of Ellen's marriage to an immensely rich Polish nobleman of legendary fame, whom she had met at a ball at the Tuileries, and who was said to have princely establishments in Paris, Nice, and Florence, a yacht at Coe's and many square miles of shooting in Transylvania. She disappeared in a kind of sulfurous apothesis, and when, a few years later, Medora again came back to New York, subdued, impoverished, mourning a third husband, and in quest of a still smaller house, people wondered that her rich niece had not been able to do something for her. Then came the news that Ellen's own marriage had ended in disaster, and that she was herself returning home to seek rest and oblivion among her kinfolk. These things passed through Newland Archer's mind a week later, as he watched the Countess Olenska enter the van der Luyden drawing-room on the evening of the momentous dinner. The occasion was a solemn one, and he wondered a little nervously how she would carry it off. She came rather late, one hand still ungloved and fastening a bracelet about her wrist, yet she entered without any appearance of haste or embarrassment the drawing-room in which New York's most chosen company was somewhat awfully assembled. In the middle of the room she paused, looking about her with a grave mouth and smiling eyes, and in that instant Newland Archer rejected the general verdict on her looks. It was true that her early radiance was gone. The red cheeks had paled. She was thin, worn, a little older-looking than her age, which must have been nearly thirty but there was about her the mysterious authority of beauty, a sureness in the carriage of the head, the movement of the eyes which, without being in the least theatrical, struck him as highly trained and full of conscious power. At the same time, she was simpler in manner than most of the ladies present, and many people, as he heard afterwards from Janey, were disappointed that her appearance was not more stylish for stylishness was what New York most valued. It was, perhaps, Archer reflected, because her early vivacity had disappeared, because she was so quiet, quiet in her movements and the tones of her low-pitched voice. New York had expected something a good deal more resonant in a young woman with such a history. The dinner was a somewhat formidable business. Dining with the van der Luydens was, at best, no light matter, and dining there with a duke, who was their cousin, was almost a religious solemnity. It pleased Archer to think that only an old New Yorker could perceive the shade of difference, to New York, between being merely a duke and being the van der Luydens' duke. New York took stray noblemen calmly, and even, except in the Struthers set, with a certain distrustful hauteur. But when they presented such credentials as these, they were received with an old-fashioned cordiality that they would have been greatly mistaken in ascribing solely to their standing in Tibret. It was for just such distinctions that the young man cherished his old New York, even while he smiled at it. 
The van der Luydens had done their best to emphasize the importance of the occasion. The Dulac Sevres and the Trevenna George II plate were out. So was the van der Luyden Lostoff, from the East India Company, and the Dagonet Crown Derby. Mrs. van der Luyden looked more than ever like a cabanel, and Mrs. Archer, in her grandmother's seed pearls and emeralds, reminded her son of an Isabey miniature. All the ladies had on their handsomest jewels, but it was characteristic of the house and the occasion that these were mostly in rather heavy, old-fashioned settings, and old Miss Lanning, who had been persuaded to come, actually wore her mother's cameos and a Spanish blonde shawl. The Countess Olenska was the only young woman at the dinner, yet as Archer scanned the smooth, plump, elderly faces between their diamond necklaces and towering ostrich feathers, they struck him as curiously immature compared with hers. It frightened him to think what must have gone to the making of her eyes. The Duke of St. Austri, who sat at his hostess's right, was naturally the chief figure of the evening, but if the Countess Olenska was less conspicuous than had been hoped, the Duke was almost invisible. Being a well-bred man, he had not, like another recent ducal visitor, come to the dinner in a shooting jacket. But his evening clothes were so shabby and baggy, and he wore them with such an air of their being homespun, that, with his stooping way of sitting and his vast beard spreading over his shirt front, he hardly gave the appearance of being in dinner attire. He was short, round-shouldered, sunburnt, with a thick nose, small eyes, and a sociable smile. But he seldom spoke, and when he did it was in such low tones that, despite the frequent silences of expectation about the table, his remarks were lost to all but his neighbors. When the men joined the ladies after dinner, the Duke went straight up to the Countess Olenska, and they sat down in a corner and plunged into an animated talk. Neither seemed aware that the Duke should first have paid respects to Mrs. Lovell Mingott and Mrs. Headley Chivers, and the Countess have conversed with that amiable hypochondriac, Mr. Urban Dagonet of Washington Square, who, in order to have the pleasure of meeting her, had broken through his fixed rule of not dining out between January and April. The two chatted together for nearly twenty minutes. Then the Countess rose and, walking alone across the wide drawing-room, sat down at Newland Archer's side. It was not the custom in New York drawing-rooms for a lady to get up and walk away from one gentleman in order to seek the company of another. Etiquette required that she should wait, immovable as an idol, while the men who wished to converse with her succeeded each other at her side. But the Countess was apparently unaware of having broken any rule. She sat at perfect ease in a corner of the sofa beside Archer, and looked at him with the kindest eyes. "'I want you to talk to me about May,' she said. Instead of answering her, he asked, "'You knew the Duke before?' "'Oh, yes, we used to see him every winter at Nice. He's very fond of gambling. He used to come to the house a great deal.' She said it in the simplest manner, as if she had said, "'He's fond of wildflowers,' and after a moment she added candidly, "'I think he's the dullest man I ever met.' This pleased her companion so much that he forgot the slight shock her previous remark had caused him. It was undeniably exciting to meet a lady who found the van der Luyden's duke dull and dared to utter the opinion. He longed to question her, to hear more about the life of which her careless words had given him so illuminating a glimpse. But he feared to touch on distressing memories, and before he could think of anything to say— she had strayed back to her original subject. May is a darling. I've seen no young girl in New York so handsome and so intelligent. Are you very much in love with her? Newland Archer reddened and laughed. As much as a man can be. She continued to consider him thoughtfully, 
as if not to miss any shade of meaning in what he said. Do you think, then, there is a limit? To being in love? If there is, I haven't found it. She glowed with sympathy. Oh, it's really and truly a romance. The most romantic of romances. How delightful! And you found it all out for yourselves. It was not in the least arranged for you? Archer looked at her incredulously. Have you forgotten, he asked with a smile, that in our country we don't allow our marriages to be arranged for us? A dusky blush rose to her cheek, and he instantly regretted his words. Yes, she answered, I'd, I'd forgotten. You must forgive me if I sometimes make these mistakes. I don't always remember that everything here is good that was, that was bad where I've come from. She looked down at her Viennese fan of eagle feathers, and he saw that her lips trembled. "'I'm so sorry,' he said impulsively. "'But you are among friends here, you know.' "'Yes, I know. "'Wherever I go, I have that feeling. "'That's why I came home. "'I want to forget everything else, "'to become a complete American again, "'like the Mingotts and Wellens and you "'and your delightful mother "'and all the other good people here tonight.' "'Ah, here's May arriving, and you will want to hurry away to her,' she added, but without moving, and her eyes turned back from the door to rest on the young man's face. The drawing-rooms were beginning to fill up with after-dinner guests, and, following Madame Olenska's glance, Archer saw May Welland entering with her mother. In her dress of white and silver with a wreath of silver blossoms in her hair, the tall girl looked like a Diana— just alighting from the chase. Oh, said Archer, I have so many rivals, you see, she's already surrounded, and there's the Duke being introduced. Then stay with me a little longer, Madame Olenska said in a low tone, just touching his knee with her plumed fan. It was the lightest touch, but it thrilled him like a caress. Yes, let me stay, he answered in the same tone hardly knowing what he said, but just then Mr. Vanderloyden came up, followed by old Mr. Urban Dagonet. The countess greeted them with her grave smile, and Archer, feeling his host's admonitory glance on him, rose and surrendered his seat. Madame Olenska held out her hand as if to bid him good-bye. "'Tomorrow, then, after five, I shall expect you,' she said." and then turned back to make room for Mr. Dagonet. Tomorrow, Archer heard himself repeating, though there had been no engagement, and during their talk she had given him no hint that she wished to see him again. As he moved away, he saw Lawrence Lefferts, tall and resplendent, leading his wife up to be introduced, and heard Gertrude Lefferts say, as she beamed on the Countess with her large, unperceiving smile, but I think we used to go to dancing school together when we were children. Behind her, waiting their turn to name themselves to the countess, Archer noticed a number of the recalcitrant couples who had declined to meet her at Mrs. Lovell Mingott's. As Mrs. Archer remarked, when the Vanderloydens chose, they knew how to give a lesson. The wonder was that they chose so seldom. The young man felt a touch on his arm and saw Mrs. Vanderloyden looking down on him from the pure eminence of black velvet and the family diamonds. "'It was good of you, dear Newland, to devote yourself so unselfishly to Madame Olenska. I told your cousin Henry he must really come to the rescue.' He was aware of smiling at her vaguely, and she added— as if condescending to his natural shyness. I've never seen May looking lovelier. The Duke thinks her the handsomest girl in the room. End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www. Dot LibriVox dot org. The Age of Innocence 
a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 9 The Countess Olenska had said, After five. And at half after the hour, Newland Archer rang the bell of the peeling stucco house, with a giant wisteria throttling its feeble, cast-iron balcony, which she had hired far down West 23rd Street from the vagabond Medora. It was certainly a strange quarter to have settled in. Small dressmakers, bird-stuffers, and people who wrote were her nearest neighbors, and farther down the disheveled street Archer recognized a dilapidated wooden house at the end of a paved path in which a writer and journalist called Winsett, whom he used to come across now and then, had mentioned that he lived. Winsett did not invite people to his house, but he had once pointed it out to Archer in the course of a nocturnal stroll, and the latter had asked himself with a little shiver if the humanities were so meanly housed in other capitals. Madame Olenska's own dwelling was redeemed from the same appearance only by a little more paint about the window frames. And as Archer mustered its modest front, he said to himself that the Polish count must have robbed her of her fortune as well as of her illusions. The young man had spent an unsatisfactory day. He had lunched with the Wellens, hoping afterward to carry off May for a walk in the park. He wanted to have her to himself, to tell her how enchanting she had looked the night before, and how proud he was of her, and to press her to hasten their marriage. But Mrs. Welland had firmly reminded him that the round of family visits was not half over, and when he hinted at advancing the date of the wedding, had raised reproachful eyebrows and sighed out, Twelve dozen of everything, hand-embroidered. Packed in the family landau, they rolled from one tribal doorstep to another, and Archer, when the afternoon's round was over, parted from his betrothed with the feeling that he had been shown off like a wild animal, cunningly trapped. He supposed that his readings in anthropology caused him to take such a coarse view of what was, after all, a simple and natural demonstration of family feeling. But when he remembered that the Wellens did not expect the wedding to take place till the following autumn, and pictured what his life would be until then, a dampness fell upon his spirit. Tomorrow, Mrs. Wellen called after him, we'll do the Chiverses and the Dallases. And he perceived that she was going through their two families alphabetically and that they were only in the first quarter of the alphabet. He had meant to tell May of the Countess Olenska's request, her command, rather, that he should call on her that afternoon, but in the brief moments when they were alone, he had had more pressing things to say. Besides, it struck him as a little absurd to allude to the matter. He knew that May most particularly wanted him to be kind to her cousin. Was it not that wish which had hastened the announcement of their engagement? It gave him an odd sensation to reflect that, but for the Countess's arrival, he might have been, if not still a free man, at least a man less irrevocably pledged. But May had willed it so, and he felt himself somehow relieved of further responsibility, and therefore at liberty, if he chose, to call on her cousin without telling her. As he stood on Madame Olenska's threshold, curiosity was his uppermost feeling. He was puzzled by the tone in which she had summoned him. He concluded that she was less simple than she seemed. The door was opened by a swarthy, foreign-looking maid with a prominent bosom under a gay neckerchief whom he vaguely fancied to be Sicilian. She welcomed him with all her white teeth, and, answering his inquiries by a headshake of incomprehension, led him through the narrow hall into a low, firelit drawing-room. The room was empty, and she left him for an appreciable time to wonder whether he had gone to find her mistress, 
or whether she had not understood what he was there for, and thought it might be to wind the clocks, of which he perceived that the only visible specimen had stopped. He knew that the southern races communicated with each other in the language of pantomime, and was mortified to find her shrugs and smiles so unintelligible. At length she returned with a lamp, and Archer, having meanwhile put together a phrase out of Dante and Petrarch, evoked the answer, La signora e fiori, ma vera subito, which he took to mean, She's out, but you'll soon see. What he saw, meanwhile, with the help of the lamp, was the faded, shadowy charm of a room unlike any room he had known. He knew that the Countess Olenska had brought some of her possessions with her, bits of wreckage, she called them, and these, he supposed, were represented by some small, slender tables of dark wood, a delicate little Greek bronze on the chimney-piece, and a stretch of red damask, nailed to the discolored wallpaper behind a couple of Italian-looking pictures in old frames. Newland Archer prided himself on his knowledge of Italian art. His boyhood had been saturated with Ruskin, and he had read all the latest books, John Addington Simmons, Vernon Lee's Euphorian, the essays of P. G. Hammerton, and a wonderful new volume called The Renaissance by Walter Pater. He talked easily of Botticelli, and spoke of Father Angelica with a faint condescension. But these pictures bewildered him, for they were like nothing that he was accustomed to look at, and, therefore, able to see, when he travelled in Italy. And perhaps, also, his powers of observation were impaired by the oddness of finding himself in this strange empty house, where apparently no one expected him. He was sorry that he had not told May Welland of Countess Olenska's request, and a little disturbed by the thought that his betrothed might come in to see her cousin. What would she think if she found him sitting there, with the air of intimacy implied by waiting alone in the dusk at a lady's fireside? But since he had come, he meant to wait, and he sank into a chair and stretched his feet to the logs. It was odd to have summoned him in that way, and then forgotten him, but Archer felt more curious than mortified. The atmosphere of the room was so different from any he had ever breathed that self-consciousness vanished in the sense of adventure. He had been before in drawing-rooms hung with red damask, with pictures of the Italian school. What struck him was the way in which Medora Manson's shabby hired house with its blighted background of pompous grass and Roger's statuettes, had, by a turn of the hand, and the skillful use of a few properties, been transformed into something intimate, foreign, subtly suggestive of old romantic scenes and sentiments. He tried to analyze the trick, to find a clue to it in the way the chairs and tables were grouped, in the fact that only two Jacques Minot roses, of which nobody ever bought less than a dozen, had been placed in the slender vase at his elbow, and in the vague, pervading perfume that was not what one put on handkerchiefs, but rather like the scent of some far-off bazaar, a smell made up of Turkish coffee and ambergris and dried roses. His mind wandered away to the question of what May's drawing-room would look like. He knew that Mr. Welland, who was behaving very handsomely, already had his eye on a newly built house in East 39th Street. The neighborhood was thought remote, and the house was built in a ghastly greenish-yellow stone that the younger architects were beginning to employ as a protest against the brownstone of which the uniform hue coated New York like a cold chocolate sauce. But the plumbing was perfect. Archer would have liked to travel, to put off the housing question, but, though the Wellens approved of an extended European honeymoon, perhaps even a winter in Egypt, they were firm as to the need of a house for the returning couple. The young man felt that his fate was sealed. 
and for the rest of his life he would go up every evening between the cast-iron railings of that greenish-yellow doorstep and pass through a Pompeian vestibule into a hall with wainscoting of varnished yellow wood. But beyond that his imagination could not travel. He knew the drawing-room above had a bay window, but he could not fancy how May would deal with it. She submitted cheerfully to the purple satin and yellow tuftings of the Welland drawing-room, to its shambool tables and gilt vitrines full of modern sacks. He saw no reason to suppose that she would want anything different in her own house, and his only comfort was to reflect that she would probably let him arrange his library as he pleased, which would be, of course, with sincere East Lake furniture and the plain new bookcases without glass doors. The young, round-bosomed maid came in, drew the curtains, pushed back a log, and said consolingly, Fera, Fera. When she had gone, Archer stood up and began to wander about. Should he wait any longer? His position was becoming rather foolish. Perhaps he had misunderstood Madame Olenska. Perhaps she had not invited him after all. Down the cobblestones of the quiet street came the ring of a stepper's hoofs. They stopped before the house, and he caught the opening of a carriage door. Parting the curtains, he looked out into the early dusk. A street lamp faced him, and in its light he saw Julius Beaufort's compact English broom, drawn by a big roan, and the banker descending from it in helping out Madame Olenska. Beaufort stood, hat in hand, saying something which his companion seemed to negative. Then they shook hands, and he jumped into his carriage while she mounted the steps. When she entered the room, she showed no surprise at seeing Archer there. Surprise seemed the emotion that she was least addicted to. "'How do you like my funny house?' she asked. "'To me it's like heaven.' As she spoke, she untied her little velvet bonnet, and, tossing it away with her long cloak, stood looking at him with meditative eyes. "'You've arranged it delightfully,' he rejoined, alive to the flatness of the words, but imprisoned in the conventional by his consuming desire to be simple and striking. "'Oh, it's a poor little place. My relations despise it. But at any rate, it's less gloomy than the Vanderloydens.' The words gave him an electric shock for few were the rebellious spirits who would have dared to call the stately home of the Vanderloydens gloomy. Those privileged to enter it shivered there and spoke of it as handsome. But suddenly he was glad that she had given voice to the general shiver. "'It's delicious what you've done here,' he repeated. "'I like the little house,' she admitted, "'but I suppose what I like is the blessedness of its being here, "'in my own country and in my own town, "'and then of being alone in it.' "'She spoke so low that he hardly heard the last phrase, "'but in his awkwardness he took it up. "'You like so much to be alone?' "'Yes, as long as my friends keep me from feeling lonely.' "'She sat down near the fire and said, "'Nastasia will bring the tea presently.' and signed to him to return to his armchair, adding, I see you've already chosen your corner. Leaning back, she folded her arms behind her head and looked at the fire under drooping lids. This is the hour I like best, don't you? A proper sense of dignity caused him to answer, I was afraid you had forgotten the hour. Beaufort must have been very engrossing. She looked amused. Why, have you waited long? Mr. Beaufort took me to see a number of houses, since it seems I'm not to be allowed to stay in this one. She appeared to dismiss both Beaufort and himself from her mind, and went on, I've never been in a city where there seems to be such a feeling against living in des quartiers eccentriques. What does it matter where one lives? I'm told this street is respectable. It's not fashionable. Fashionable? Do you all think so much of that? Why not make one's own fashions? But I suppose I've lived too independently. At any rate, I want to do what you all do. 
I want to feel cared for and safe. He was touched, as he had been the evening before when she spoke of her need of guidance. That's what your friends want to feel. New York's an awfully safe place, he added with a flash of sarcasm. Yes, isn't it? One feels that, she cried, missing the mockery. Being here is like... like being taken on a holiday when one has been a good little girl and done all one's lessons. The analogy was meant well, but did not altogether please him. He did not mind being flippant about New York, but disliked to hear anyone else take the same tone. He wondered if she did not begin to see what a powerful engine it was, and how nearly it had crushed her. The Lovell Mingott's dinner, patched up in extremis out of all sorts of social odds and ends, ought to have taught her the narrowness of her escape. But either she had been all along unaware of having skirted disaster, or else she had lost sight of it, in the triumph of the Vanderloyden evening. Archer inclined to the former theory. He fancied that her New York was still completely undifferentiated, and the conjecture nettled him. Last night, he said, New York laid itself out for you. The Vanderloydens do nothing by halves. No, how kind they are. It was such a nice party— Everyone seems to have such an esteem for them. The terms were hardly adequate. She might have spoken in that way of a tea party at the dear old Miss Lanning's. The Vanderloydens, said Archer, feeling himself pompous as he spoke, are the most powerful influence in New York society. Unfortunately, owing to her health, they receive very seldom— she unclasped her hands from behind her head and looked at him meditatively. Isn't that perhaps the reason? The reason? For their great influence, that they make themselves so rare. He colored a little, stared at her, and suddenly felt the penetration of the remark. At a stroke, she had pricked the Vanderloydens and they collapsed. He laughed and sacrificed them. Nastasia brought the tea, with handleless Japanese cups and little covered dishes, placing the tray on a low table. "'But you'll explain these things to me. You'll tell me all I ought to know,' Madame Olenska continued, leaning forward to hand him his cup. "'It's you who are telling me, opening my eyes to things I'd looked at so long that I'd ceased to see them.' She detached a small gold cigarette case from one of her bracelets— held it out to him and took a cigarette herself. On the chimney were long spills for lighting them. Ah, then we can both help each other. But I want help so much more. You must tell me just what to do. It was on the tip of his tongue to reply, Don't be seen driving about the streets with Beaufort. But he was being too deeply drawn into the atmosphere of the room, which was her atmosphere, and to give advice of that sort would have been like telling someone who was bargaining for an attar of roses in Samarkand that one should always be provided with arctics for a New York winter. New York seemed much farther off than Samarkand, and if they were indeed to help each other, she was rendering what might prove the first of their mutual services by making him look at his native city objectively. Viewed thus as through the wrong end of a telescope. It looked disconcertingly small and distant. But then, from Samarkand, it would. A flame darted from the logs, and she bent over the fire, stretching her thin hands so close to it that a faint halo shone about the oval nails. The light touched to russet the rings of dark hair escaping from her braids and made her pale face paler. There are plenty of people to tell you what to do, Archer rejoined, obscurely envious of them. Oh, all my aunts, and my dear old granny? She considered the idea impartially. They're all a little vexed with me for setting up for myself. Poor granny, especially. She wanted to keep me with her, but I had to be free. He was impressed by this light way of speaking of the formidable Catherine, 
and moved by the thought of what must have given Madame Olenska this thirst for even the loneliest kind of freedom. But the idea of Beaufort gnawed at him. I think I understand how you feel, he said. Still, your family can advise you, explain the differences, show you the way. She lifted her thin black eyebrows. Is New York such a labyrinth? I thought it so straight up and down, like Fifth Avenue, and with all the cross streets numbered. She seemed to guess his faint disapproval of this, and added with the rare smile that enchanted her whole face, If you knew how I like it just for that, the straight up and downness, and the big honest labels on everything. He saw his chance. Everything may be labeled, but everybody is not. Perhaps. I may simplify too much, but you'll warn me if I do. She turned from the fire to look at him. There are only two people here who make me feel as if they understood what I mean and could explain things to me. You and Mr. Beaufort. Archer winced at the joining of the names and then, with a quick readjustment, understood, sympathized, and pitied. So close to the powers of evil, she must have lived that she still breathed more freely in their air. But since she felt that he understood her also, his business would be to make her see Beaufort as he really was, with all he represented, and abhor it. He answered gently, I understand, but just at first, don't let go of your old friend's hands. I mean the older women, your Granny Mingott, Mrs. Welland, Mrs. Vanderloyden. They like and admire you. They want to help you. Oh, I know, I know, but on condition that they don't hear anything unpleasant. Aunt Welland put it in those very words when I tried... Does no one want to know the truth here, Mr. Archer? The real loneliness is living among all these kind people who only ask one to pretend. She lifted her hands to her face, and he saw her thin shoulders shaken by a sob. Madame Olenska, oh, don't, Ellen, he cried, starting up and bending over her. He drew down one of her hands, clasping and chafing it like a child's, while he murmured reassuring words, but in a moment she freed herself and looked up at him with wet lashes. Does no one cry here either? I suppose there's no need to in heaven, she said, straightening her loosened braids with a laugh and bending over the tea kettle. It was burnt into his consciousness that he had called her Ellen, called her so twice, and that she had not noticed it, Far down the inverted telescope he saw the faint white figure of May Welland in New York. Suddenly Nastasia put her head in to say something in her rich Italian. Madame Olenska, again, again with a hand at her hair, uttered an exclamation of assent, a flashing chia, chia, and the Duke of St. Austri entered, piloting a tremendous black-wigged and red-plumed lady in overflowing furs. My dear Countess, I've brought an old friend of mine to see you, Mrs. Struthers. She wasn't asked to the party last night, and she wants to know you. The Duke beamed on the group, and Madame Olenska advanced with a murmur of welcome towards the queer couple. She seemed to have no idea how oddly matched they were, or what a liberty the Duke had taken in bringing his companion. And to do him justice, as Archer perceived, the Duke seemed as unaware of it himself. "'Of course I want to know you, my dear,' cried Mrs. Struthers in a round, rolling voice that matched her bold feathers and her brazen wig. "'I want to know everyone who's young and interesting and charming. And the Duke tells me you like music, didn't you, Duke? You're a pianist yourself, I believe. Well, do you want to hear Sarasate play tomorrow evening at my house?' You know I've something going on every Sunday evening. It's the day when New York doesn't know what to do with itself. And so I say to it, 
Come and be amused. And the Duke thought you'd be tempted by Sarasate. You'll find a number of your friends. Madame Olenska's face grew brilliant with pleasure. How kind, how good of the Duke to think of me. She pushed a chair up to the tea table, and Mrs. Struthers sank into it delectably. Of course I shall be too happy to come. That's all right, my dear, and bring your young gentleman with you. Mrs. Struthers extended a hail fellow hand to Archer. I can't put a name to you, but I'm sure I've met you. I've met everybody here or in Paris or London. Aren't you in diplomacy? All the diplomatists come to me. You'll like music, too. Duke, you must be sure to bring him. The Duke said, rather, from the depths of his beard, and Archer withdrew with a stiffly circular bow that made him feel as full of spine as a self-conscious schoolboy among careless and unnoticing elders. He was not sorry for the denouement of his visit. He only wished it had come sooner, and spared him a certain waste of emotion. As he went out into the wintry night, New York again became vast and imminent, and May Welland, the loveliest woman in it. He turned into his florists to send her the daily box of lilies of the valley which, to his confusion, he found he had forgotten that morning. As he wrote a word on his card and waited for an envelope, he glanced about the embowered shop and his eye lit on a cluster of yellow roses. He had never seen any as sun-golden before, and his first impulse was to send them to May instead of the lilies. But they did not look like her. There was something too rich, too strong in their fiery beauty. In a sudden revulsion of mood, and almost without knowing what he did, he signed to the florist to lay the roses in another long box, and slipped his card into a second envelope, on which he wrote the name of the Countess Olenska. Then, just as he was turning away, he drew the card out again and left the empty envelope on the box. "'They'll go at once?' he inquired, pointing to the roses. The florist assured him that they would. End of Chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 10 the next day he persuaded May to escape for a walk in the park after luncheon. As was the custom in old-fashioned Episcopalian New York, she usually accompanied her parents to church on Sunday afternoons. But Mrs. Welland condoned her truancy, having that very morning won her over to the necessity of a long engagement, with time to prepare a hand-embroidered trousseau containing the proper number of dozens. The day was delectable. The bare vaulting of trees along the mall was ceilinged with lapis lazuli and arched above snow that shone like splintered crystals. It was the weather to call out May's radiance, and she burned like a young maple in the frost. Archer was proud of the glances turned on her, and the simple joy of possessorship cleared away his underlying perplexities. It's so delicious, waking every morning to smell lilies of the valley in one's room, she said. Yesterday they came late. I hadn't time in the morning, but your remembering each day to send them makes me love them so much more than if you'd given a standing order and they came every morning on the minute, like one's music teacher, as I know Gertrude Lefferts did, for instance, when she and Lawrence were engaged. Well, they would— laughed Archer, amused at her keenness. He looked sideways at her fruit-like cheek, and felt rich and secure enough to add, When I sent your lilies yesterday afternoon, I saw some rather glorious yellow roses, and packed them off to Madame Olenska. Was that right? How dear of you! Anything of that kind delights her. It's odd she didn't mention it. She lunched with us today— spoke of Mr. Beaufort's having sent her wonderful orchids, 
and cousin Henry Vanderloyden a whole hamper of carnations from Scoiter Cliff. She seems so surprised to receive flowers. Don't people send them in Europe? She thinks it's such a pretty custom. Oh, well, no wonder mine were overshadowed by Beaufort's, said Archer irritably. Then he remembered that he had not put a card with the roses, and was vexed at having spoken of them. He wanted to say, I called on your cousin yesterday, but hesitated. If Madame Olenska had not spoken of his visit, it might seem awkward that he should. Yet not to do so gave the affair an air of mystery that he disliked. To shake off the question, he began to talk of their own plans, their future, and Mrs. Wellen's insistence on a long engagement. If you call it long, Isabel Chivers and Reggie were engaged for two years, Grace and Thorley for nearly a year and a half. Why, aren't we very well off as we are? It was the traditional maidenly interrogation, and he felt ashamed of himself for finding it singularly childish. No doubt she simply echoed what was said to her, but she was nearing her twenty-second birthday, and he wondered at what age nice women began to speak for themselves. Never, if we won't let them, I suppose, he mused, and recalled his mad outburst to Sillerton Jackson. Women ought to be as free as we are. It would presently be his task to take the bandage from this young woman's eyes and bid her look forth on the world. But how many generations of the women who had gone to her making had descended, bandaged, to the family vault? He shivered a little, remembering some of the new ideas in his scientific books and the much-cited instance of the Kentucky cavefish, which had ceased to develop eyes because they had no use for them. What if, when he had bidden May Wellen to open hers, they could only look out blankly at blankness? We might be much better off. We might be altogether together. We might travel— her face lit up. That would be lovely, she owned. She would love to travel. But her mother would not understand their wanting to do things so differently. As if the mere differently didn't account for it, the wooer insisted. Newland, you're so original, she exulted. His heart sank, for he saw that he was saying all the things that young men in the same situation were expected to say and that she was making the answers that instinct and tradition taught her to make, even to the point of calling him original. Original! We're all as like each other as those dolls cut out of the same folded paper. We're like patterns stenciled on a wall. Can't you and I strike out for ourselves, May? He had stopped and faced her in the excitement of their discussion, and her eyes rested on him with a bright, unclouded admiration. "'Mercy, shall we elope?' she laughed. "'If you would. "'You do love me, Newland. I'm so happy. "'Then why not be happier? "'We can't behave like people in novels, though, can we? "'Why not? Why not? Why not?' "'She looked a little bored by his insistence. "'She knew very well that they couldn't, "'but it was troublesome to have to produce a reason.' I'm not clever enough to argue with you, but that kind of thing is rather vulgar, isn't it? She suggested, relieved to have hit on a word that would assuredly extinguish the whole subject. Are you so much afraid, then, of being vulgar? She was evidently staggered by this. Of course I should hate it, and so would you, she rejoined a trifle irritably. He stood silent, beating his stick nervously against his boot-top, and feeling that she had indeed found the right way of closing the discussion. She went on light-heartedly. Oh, did I tell you that I showed Ellen my ring? She thinks it the most beautiful setting she ever saw. There's nothing like it in the Rue de la Paix, she said. I do love you, Newland, for being so artistic. The next afternoon, as Archer, before dinner, sat smoking, sullenly in his study, Janey wandered in on him. He had failed to stop at his club on the way up from the office, 
where he exercised the profession of the law in the leisurely manner common to well-to-do New Yorkers of his class. He was out of spirits and slightly out of temper, and a haunting horror of doing the same thing every day at the same hour besieged his brain. Sameness, sameness, he muttered, the word running through his head like a persecuting tune as he saw the familiar tall-hatted figures lounging behind the plate glass. And because he usually dropped in at the club at that hour, he had gone home instead. He knew not only what they were likely to be talking about, but the part each one would take in the discussion. The Duke, of course, would be their principal theme, though the appearance in Fifth Avenue of a golden-haired lady in a small canary-colored broom with a pair of black cobs, for which Beaufort was generally thought responsible, would also doubtless be thoroughly gone into. Such women, as they were called, were few in New York, those driving their own carriages still fewer, and the appearance of Miss Fanny Ring in Fifth Avenue at the fashionable hour had profoundly agitated society. Only the day before her carriage had passed Mrs. Lovell Mingott's, and the latter had instantly rung the little bell at her elbow and ordered the coachman to drive her home. What if it had happened to Mrs. Vanderloyden? people asked each other with a shudder. Archer could hear Lawrence Lefferts at that very hour, holding forth on the disintegration of society. He raised his head irritably when his sister Janie entered, then quickly bent over his book, Swinburne's Chastelard, just out, as if he had not seen her. She glanced at the writing-table heaped with books, opened a volume of the Conte Drolatique, made a wry face over the archaic French, and sighed, "'What learned things you read!' "'Well?' he asked, as she hovered Cassandra-like before him. "'Mother's very angry.' "'Angry? With whom? About what?' "'Miss Sophie Jackson has just been here. "'She brought word that her brother would come in after dinner,' She couldn't say very much, because he forbade her to. He wishes to give all the details himself. He's with cousin Louisa Vanderloyden now. For heaven's sake, my dear girl, try a fresh start. It would take an omniscient deity to know what you're talking about. It's not a time to be profane, Newland. Mother feels badly enough about your not going to church. With a groan, he plunged back into his book. Newland, do listen. Your friend, Madame Olenska, was at Mrs. Lemuel Struther's party last night. She went there with the Duke and Mr. Beaufort. At the last clause of this announcement, a senseless anger swelled the young man's breast. To smother it, he laughed. Well, what of it? I knew she meant to. Janie paled, and her eyes began to project. You knew she meant to, and you didn't try to stop her? To warn her? Stop her? Warn her? He laughed again. I'm not engaged to be married to the Countess Olenska. The words had a fantastic sound in his own ears. You're marrying into her family. Oh, family, family, he jeered. Newland, don't you care about family? Not a brass farthing. Nor about what Cousin Louisa van der Luyden will think. Not the half of one. If she thinks such an old maid's rubbish, Mother is not an old maid, said his virgin sister with pinched lips. He felt like shouting back. Yes, she is, and so are the van der Luydens, and so we all are when it comes to being so much as brushed by the wingtip of reality. But he saw her long, gentle face, puckering into tears, and felt ashamed of the useless pain he was inflicting. "'Hang, Countess Olenska! Don't be a goose, Janie. I'm not her keeper!' "'No, but you did ask the Wellens to announce your engagement sooner, so that we might all back her up. And if it hadn't been for that, Cousin Louisa would never 
have invited her to the dinner for the Duke. Well, what harm was there in inviting her? She was the best-looking woman in the room. She made the dinner a little less funereal than the usual van der Luyden banquet. You know Cousin Henry asked her to please you. He persuaded Cousin Louisa, and now, and now they're so upset that they're going back to Scoitercliff tomorrow. I think, Newland, you'd better come down. You don't seem to understand how Mother feels. In the drawing room, Newland found his mother. She raised a troubled brow from her needlework to ask, "Has Janey told you?" "Yes." He tried to keep his tone as measured as her own, but I can't take it very seriously. Not the fact of having offended cousin Louisa and cousin Henry. The fact that they can be offended by such a trifle as Countess Olenska's going to the house of a woman they consider common. Consider, well, who is? But who has good music and amuses people on Sunday evenings when the whole of New York is dying of inanition? Good music. All I know is there was a woman who got up on a table and sang the things they sing at the places you go to in Paris. There was smoking, and champagne. Well, that kind of thing happens in other places, and the world still goes on. I don't suppose, dear. You're really defending the French Sunday. I've heard you often enough, Mother, grumble at the English Sunday when we've been in London. New York is neither Paris nor London. Oh no, it's not. Her son groaned. You mean, I suppose, that society here is not as brilliant. You're right, I dare say, but we belong here, and the people should respect our ways when they come among us. Ellen Olenska, especially. She came back to get away from the kind of life people lead in brilliant societies. Newland made no answer, and after a moment, his mother ventured, "I was going to put on my bonnet, and ask you to take me to see cousin Louisa for a moment before dinner." He frowned, and she continued, "I thought you might explain to her what you've just said, that society abroad is different, that people are not as particular." And that Madame Olenska may not have realized how we feel about such things. It would be, you know, dear," she added with an innocent adroitness, "in Madame Olenska's interest if you did. Dearest mother, I really don't see how we are concerned in the matter. The Duke took Madame Olenska to Mrs. Struthers's. In fact. He brought Mrs. Struthers to call on her. I was there when they came. If the Vanderloydens want to quarrel with anyone, the real culprit is under their own roof. Quarrel, Newland? Did you ever know of cousin Henry quarrelling? Besides, the Duke is his guest and a stranger too. Strangers don't discriminate. How should they? Countess Olenska is a New Yorker and should have respected the feelings of New York. Well then, if they must have a victim, you have my leave to throw Madame Olenska to them," cried her son, exasperated. "I don't see myself or you either offering ourselves up to expiate her crimes." Oh, of course you only see the Mingott side," his mother answered in the sensitive tone that was her nearest approach to anger. The sad butler drew back the drawing room portieres and announced, "Mr. Henry Vanderloyden." Mrs. Archer dropped her needle and pushed her chair back with an agitated hand. Another lamp, she cried to the retreating servant, while Janey bent over to straighten her mother's cap. Mr. Vanderloyden's figure loomed on the threshold, and Newland Archer went forward to greet his cousin. We were just talking about you, sir, he said. Mr. Vanderloyden seemed overwhelmed by the announcement. He drew off his gloves to shake hands with the ladies and smoothed his tall hat shyly, while Janey pushed an armchair forward, and Archer continued, "And the Countess Olenska." Mrs. Archer paled. "Ah, charming woman! I have just been to see her," said Mr. Vanderloyden, complacency restored to his brow. He sank into the chair, laid his hat and gloves on the floor beside him in the old-fashioned way, and went on. She has a real gift for arranging flowers, 
I had sent her a few carnations from Scoiter Cliff, and I was astonished. Instead of massing them in big bunches, as our head gardener does, she had scattered them about loosely, here and there. I can't say how. The Duke had told me, he said, go and see how cleverly she's arranged her drawing room. And she has. I should really like to take Louisa to see her, if the neighborhood were not so unpleasant. A dead silence greeted this unusual flow of words from Mr. Vanderleuten. Mrs. Archer drew her embroidery out of the basket, into which she had nervously tumbled it, and Newland, leaning against the chimney-place, and twisting a hummingbird feather screen in his hand, saw Janie's gaping countenance lit up by the coming of the second lamp. "'The fact is,' Mr. Vanderloyden continued, stroking his long, grey leg, with a bloodless hand weighed down by the patroon's great signet ring, the fact is, I dropped in to thank her for the very pretty note she wrote me about my flowers, and also, but this is between ourselves, of course, to give her a friendly warning about allowing the Duke to carry her off to parties with him. I don't know if you've heard. Mrs. Archer produced an indulgent smile. Has the Duke been carrying her off to parties? You know what these English grandees are. They're all alike. Louisa and I are very fond of our cousin, but it's hopeless to expect people who are accustomed to the European courts to trouble themselves about our little Republican distinctions. The Duke goes where he's amused. Mr. Vanderloyden paused, but no one spoke. Yes, it seems he took her with him last night to Mrs. Lemuel Struthers's. Sillerton Jackson has just been to us with a foolish story, and— Louisa was rather troubled, so I thought the shortest way was to go straight to Countess Olenska and explain, by the merest hint, you know, how we feel in New York about certain things. I felt I might, without indelicacy, because the evening she dined with us she rather suggested, rather let me see that she would be grateful for guidance. And she was. Mr. Vanderloyden looked about the room, with what would have been self-satisfaction on features less purged of the vulgar passions. On his face it became a mild benevolence, which Mrs. Archer's countenance dutifully reflected. "'How kind you both are, dear Henry, always. Newland will particularly appreciate what you have done because of dear May and his new relations.' She shot an admonitory glance at her son, who said, "'Immensely, sir,' but I was sure you'd like Madame Olenska. Mr. Vanderloyden looked at him with extreme gentleness. I never ask to my house, dear Newland, he said, anyone whom I do not like. And so I have just told Sillerton Jackson. With a glance at the clock he rose and added, But Louisa will be waiting. We're dining early to take the Duke to the opera. After the portiers had solemnly closed behind their visitor, a silence fell upon the Archer family. "'Gracious! How romantic!' at last broke explosively from Janie. No one knew exactly what inspired her elliptic comments, and her relations had long since given up trying to interpret them. Mrs. Archer shook her head with a sigh. Provided it all turns out for the best, she said, in the tone of one who knows how surely it will not. Newland, you must stay and see Sillerton Jackson when he comes this evening. I really shan't know what to say to him. Poor mother, but he won't come, her son laughed, stooping to kiss away her frown. End of chapter 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 11 Some two weeks later, Newland Archer, 
sitting in abstracted idleness in his private compartment of the office of Letterblair, Lamson and Lowe, attorneys at law, was summoned by the head of the firm. Old Mr. Letterblair, the accredited legal adviser of three generations of New York gentility, was throned behind his mahogany desk in evident perplexity. As he stroked his close-clipped white whiskers and ran his hand through the rumpled gray locks above his jutting brows, his disrespectful junior partner thought how much he looked like the family physician, annoyed with a patient whose symptoms refused to be classified. "'My dear sir,' he always addressed Archer as sir, "'I have sent for you to go into a little matter, a matter which, for the moment, I prefer not to mention to either Mr. Skipworth or Mr. Redwood. The gentlemen he spoke of were the other senior partners of the firm, for, as was always the case with legal associations of old standing in New York, all the partners named on the office letterhead were long since dead, and Mr. Letterblair, for example, was, professionally speaking, his own grandson. He leaned back in his chair with a furrowed brow. For family reasons, he continued. Archer looked up. The Mingott family, said Mr. Letterblair, with an explanatory smile and bow. Mrs. Manson Mingott sent for me yesterday. Her granddaughter, the Countess Olenska, wishes to sue her husband for divorce. Certain papers have been placed in my hands. He paused and drummed on his desk. In view of your prospective alliance with the family, I should like to consult you to consider the case with you before taking any further steps. Archer felt the blood in his temples. He had seen the Countess Olenska only once since his visit to her, and that at the opera, in the Mingott box. During this interval she had become a less vivid image, receding from his foreground as May Welland resumed her rightful place in it. He had not heard her divorce spoken of since Janie's first random allusion to it, and had dismissed the tale as unfounded gossip. Theoretically, the idea of a divorce was almost as distasteful to him as to his mother, and he was annoyed that Mr. Letterblair, no doubt prompted by old Catherine Mingott, should be so evidently planning to draw him into the affair. After all, there were plenty of Mingott men for such jobs, and as yet he was not even a Mingott by marriage. He waited for the senior partner to continue. Mr. Letterblair unlocked a drawer and drew out a packet. If you will run your eye over these papers, Archer frowned. I beg your pardon, sir, but... Just because of the prospective relationship, I should prefer your consulting Mr. Skipworth or Mr. Redwood. Mr. Letterblair looked surprised and slightly offended. It was unusual for a junior to reject such an opening. He bowed. I respect your scruple, sir, but in this case I believe true delicacy requires you to do as I ask. Indeed, the suggestion is not mine— but Mrs. Manson Mingott's, and her son's. I have seen Lovell Mingott and also Mr. Welland. They all named you. Archer felt his temper rising. He had been somewhat languidly drifting with events for the last fortnight, and letting May's fair looks and radiant nature obliterate the rather importunate pressure of the Mingott claims. But this behest of old Mrs. Mingott's roused him to a sense of what the clan thought they had the right to exact from a prospective son-in-law, and he chafed at the role. Her uncles ought to deal with this, he said. They have. The matter has been gone into by the family. They are opposed to the Countess's idea, but she is firm and insists on a legal opinion. The young man was silent. He had not opened the packet in his hand. Does she want to marry again? I believe it is suggested, 
but she denies it. Then, will you oblige me, Mr. Archer, by first looking through those papers? Afterward, when we have talked the case over, I will give you my opinion. Archer withdrew reluctantly with the unwelcome documents. Since their last meeting, he had half unconsciously collaborated with events in ridding himself of the burden of Madame Olenska. His hour alone with her by the firelight had drawn them into a momentary intimacy on which the Duke of St. Austrey's intrusion with Mrs. Lemuel Struthers and the Countess's joyous greeting of them had rather providentially broken. Two days later, Archer had assisted at the comedy of her reinstatement in the van der Luyden's favor, and had said to himself, with a touch of tartness, that a lady who knew how to thank all powerful elderly gentlemen to such good purpose for a bunch of flowers, did not need either the private consolations or the public championship of a young man of his small compass. To look at the matter in this light simplified his own case and surprisingly furbished up all the dim domestic virtues. He could not picture May Welland, in whatever conceivable emergency, hawking about her private difficulties and lavishing her confidences on strange men, and she had never seemed to him finer or fairer in the week that followed. He had even yielded to her wish for a long engagement, since she had found the one disarming answer to his plea for haste. You know when it comes to the point your parents have always let you have your way, ever since you were a little girl, he argued, and she had answered with her clearest look, Yes, and that's what makes it so hard to refuse the very last thing they'll ever ask of me as a little girl. That was the old New York note. That was the kind of answer he would like always to be sure of his wife's making. If one had habitually breathed the New York air, there were times when anything less crystalline seemed stifling. The papers he had retired to read did not tell him much in fact, but they plunged him into an atmosphere in which he choked and sputtered. They consisted mainly of an exchange of letters between Count Olensky's solicitors and a French legal firm to whom the Countess had applied for the settlement of her financial situation. There was also a short letter from the Count to his wife. After reading it, Newland Archer rose, jammed the papers back into their envelope, and re-entered Mr. Letterblair's office. "'Here are the letters, sir. If you wish, I'll see Madame Olenska,' he said in a constrained voice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Come and dine with me tonight if you're free, and we'll go into the matter afterward, in case you wish to call on our client tomorrow. Newland Archer walked straight home again that afternoon. It was a winter evening of transparent clearness, with an innocent young moon above the housetops, and he wanted to fill his soul's lungs with the pure radiance and not exchange a word with anyone— till he and Mr. Letterblair were closeted together after dinner. It was impossible to decide otherwise than he had done. He must see Madame Olenska himself, rather than let her secrets be bared to any other eyes. A great wave of compassion had swept away his indifference and impatience. She stood before him as an exposed and pitiful figure, to be saved at all costs, from further wounding herself in her mad plunges against fate. He remembered what she had told him of Mrs. Welland's request to be spared whatever was unpleasant in her history, and winced at the thought that it was perhaps this attitude of mind which kept the New York air so pure. Are we only Pharisees after all? he wondered puzzled by the efforts to reconcile his instinctive disgust at human vileness with his equally instinctive pity for human frailty. For the first time, he perceived how elementary his own principles had always been. He passed for a young man who had not been afraid of risks, and he knew that his secret love affair with poor, silly Mrs. Thorley Rushworth had not been 
too secret, to invest him with a becoming air of adventure. But Mrs. Rushworth was that kind of woman, foolish, vain, clandestine by nature, and far more attracted by the secrecy and peril of the affair than by such charms and qualities as he possessed. The affair, in short, had been of the kind that most of the young men of his age had been through, and emerged from, with calm consciences, and an undisturbed belief in the abysmal distinction between the woman one loved and respected, and those one enjoyed and pitied. In this view they were sedulously abetted by their mothers, aunts, and other elderly female relatives, all who shared Mrs. Archer's belief that when such things happened, it was undoubtedly foolish of the man, but somehow always criminal of the woman. All the elderly ladies whom Archer knew regarded any woman who loved imprudently as necessarily unscrupulous and designing, and mere simple-minded man as powerless in her clutches. The only thing to do was to persuade him, as early as possible, to marry a nice girl, and then trust to her to look after him. In the complicated old European communities, Archer began to guess love problems might be less simple and less easily classified. Rich and idle and ornamental societies must produce many more such situations, and there might even be one in which a woman naturally sensitive and aloof, would yet, from the force of circumstances, from sheer defenselessness and loneliness, be drawn into a tie inexcusable by conventional standards. On reaching home he wrote a line to the Countess Olenska, asking at what hour of the next day she could receive him, and dispatched it by a messenger boy, who returned presently with a word to the effect that she was going to Scoiter Cliff the next morning, to stay over Sunday with the Vanderloydens, but that he would find her alone that evening after dinner. The note was written on a rather untidy half-sheet without date or address, but her hand was firm and free. He was amused at the idea of her weekending in the stately solitude of Scoiter Cliff, but immediately afterward felt that there, of all places, she would most feel the chill of minds rigorously averted from the unpleasant. He was at Mr. Letterblair's punctually at seven, glad of the pretext for excusing himself soon after dinner. He had formed his own opinion from the papers entrusted to him, and did not especially want to go into the matter with his senior partner. Mr. Letterblair was a widower, and they dined alone— copiously and slowly in a dark, shabby room hung with yellowing prints of the death of Chatham and the coronation of Napoleon. On the sideboard, between fluted Sheraton knife-cases, stood a decanter of Hope Briand, and another of Old Lanning Port, the gift of a client, which the wastrel Tom Lanning had sold off a year or two before his mysterious and discreditable death in San Francisco an incident less publicly humiliating to the family than the sale of the cellar. After a velvety oyster soup came shad and cucumbers, then a young broiled turkey with corn fritters, followed by a canvas back with currant jelly and celery mayonnaise. Mr. Letterblair, who lunched on a sandwich and tea, dined deliberately and deeply, and insisted on his guests doing the same. Finally, when the closing rites had been accomplished, the cloth was removed, cigars were lit, and Mr. Letterblair, leaning back in his chair and pushing the port westward, said, spreading his back agreeably to the coal fire behind him, "'The whole family are against a divorce, and I think rightly.' Archer instantly felt himself on the other side of the argument. "'But why, sir, if there ever was a case—' Well, what's the use? She's here, he's there, the Atlantic's between them. She'll never get back a dollar more of her money than what he's voluntarily returned to her. Their damned heathen marriage settlements take precious good care of that. As things go over there, Olenski's acted generously. He might have turned her out without a penny. The young man knew this and was silent. 
I understand, though, Mr. Letterblair continued, that she attaches no importance to the money. Therefore, as the family say, why not let well enough alone? Archer had gone to the house an hour earlier, in full agreement with Mr. Letterblair's view, but put into words by this selfish, well-fed, and supremely indifferent old man, it suddenly became the Pharisaic voice of a society wholly absorbed in barricading itself against the unpleasant. I think that's for her to decide. Hmm. Have you considered the consequences if she decides for divorce? You mean the threat in her husband's letter? What weight would that carry? It's no more than the vague charge of an angry blackguard. Yes, but it might make some unpleasant talk if he really defends the suit. Unpleasant, said Archer explosively. Mr. Letterblair looked at him from under inquiring eyebrows, and the young man, aware of the uselessness of trying to explain what was in his mind, bowed acquiescently, while his senior continued, Divorce is always unpleasant. You agree with me? Mr. Ladderblair resumed after a waiting silence. Naturally, said Archer. Well, then, I may count on you. The Mingotts may count on you to use your influence against the idea. Archer hesitated. I can't pledge myself till I've seen the Countess Olenska, he said at length. Mr. Archer, I don't understand you. Do you want to marry into a family with a scandalous divorce suit hanging over it? I don't think that has anything to do with the case. Mr. Letterblair put down his glass of port and fixed on his young partner a cautious and apprehensive gaze. Archer understood that he ran the risk of having his mandate withdrawn, and for some obscure reason he disliked the prospect. Now that the job had been thrust on him, he did not propose to relinquish it, and to guard against the possibility he saw that he must reassure the unimaginative old man who was the legal conscience of the Mingotts. You may be sure, sir, that I shan't commit myself until I've reported to you. What I meant was that I'd rather not give an opinion until I've heard what Madame Olenska has to say. Mr. Letterblair nodded approvingly at an excess of caution worthy of the best New York tradition, and the young man, glancing at his watch, pleaded an engagement and took leave. End of Chapter 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton, read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter Twelve. Old-fashioned New York dined at seven, and the habit of after-dinner calls, though derided in Archer's set still generally prevailed. As the young man strolled up Fifth Avenue from Waverly Place, the long thoroughfare was deserted, but for a group of carriages standing before the Reggie Chiverses, where there was a dinner for the Duke, and the occasional figure of an elderly gentleman in heavy overcoat and muffler, ascending a brownstone doorstep and disappearing into a gaslit hall. Thus, as Archer crossed Washington Square, he remarked that old Mr. Dulac was calling on his cousins, the Dagonets, and, turning down the corner of West Tenth Street, he saw Mr. Skipworth, of his own firm, obviously bound on a visit to the Miss Lannings. A little farther up Fifth Avenue, Beaufort appeared on his doorstep, darkly projected against a blaze of light, descended to his private broom, and rolled away to a mysterious and probably unmentionable destination. It was not an opera night, and no one was giving a party, so that Beaufort's outing was undoubtedly of a clandestine nature. Archer connected it in his mind with a little house beyond Lexington Avenue, in which beribboned window curtains and flower boxes had recently appeared, and before whose newly painted door 
the canary-colored broom of Miss Fanny Ring was frequently seen to wait. Beyond the small and slippery pyramid which composed Mrs. Archer's world lay the almost unmapped quarter inhabited by artists, musicians, and people who wrote. These scattered fragments of humanity had never shown any desire to be amalgamated with the social structure. In spite of odd ways, they were said to be, for the most part, quite respectable, but they preferred to keep to themselves. Medora Manson, in her prosperous days, had inaugurated a literary salon, but it had soon died out, owing to the reluctance of the literary to frequent it. Others had made the same attempt, and there was a household of blenkers, an intense and voluble mother, and three blousy daughters who imitated her, where one met Edwin Booth and Patty and William Winter, and the new Shakespearean actor George Rignold, and some of the magazine editors and musical and literary critics. Mrs. Archer and her group felt a certain timidity concerning these persons. They were odd. They were uncertain. They had things one didn't know about in the background of their lives and minds. Literature and art were deeply respected in the Archer set, and Mrs. Archer was always at pains to tell her children how much more agreeable and cultivated society had been when it included such figures as Washington Irving, Fitzgreen Halleck, and the poet of The Culprit Fay. The most celebrated authors of that generation had been gentlemen. Perhaps the unknown persons who succeeded them had gentlemanly sentiments, but their origin, their appearance, their hair, their intimacy with the stage and the opera made any old New York criterion inapplicable to them. When I was a girl, Mrs. Archer used to say, we knew everybody between the Battery and Canal Street, and only the people one knew had carriages. It was perfectly easy to place anyone then. Now one can't tell, and I prefer not to try." Only old Catherine Mingott, with her absence of moral prejudices, and an almost parvenu indifference to the subtler distinctions, might have bridged the abyss. But she had never opened a book, or looked at a picture, and cared for music only because it reminded her of gala nights at the Italienne, in the days of her triumph at the Tuileries. Possibly Beaufort, who was her match in daring, would have succeeded in bringing about a fusion, but his grand house and silk-stockinged footmen were an obstacle to informal sociability. Moreover, he was as illiterate as old Mrs. Mingott, and considered fellows who wrote as the mere paid purveyors of rich men's pleasures, and no one rich enough to influence his opinion had ever questioned it. Newland Archer had been aware of these things ever since he could remember— and had accepted them as part of the structure of his universe. He knew that there were societies where painters and poets and novelists, and men of science, and even great actors, were as sought after as dukes, and he had often pictured to himself what it would have been to live in the intimacy of drawing-rooms dominated by the talk of Mary Mee, or Thackeray, Browning, or William Morris. But such things were inconceivable in New York, and unsettling to think of. Archer knew most of the fellows who wrote, the musicians and the painters. He met them at the Century or at the little musical and theatrical clubs that were beginning to come into existence. He enjoyed them there, and was bored with them at the Blenkers, where they were mingled with fervid and dowdy women, who passed them about like captured curiosities— and even after his most exciting talks with Ned Winsett, he always came away with the feeling that, if his world was small, so was theirs, and that the only way to enlarge either was to reach a stage of manners where they would naturally merge. He was reminded of this by trying to picture the society in which the Countess Olenska had lived and suffered, and also, perhaps, tasted mysterious joys— he remembered with what amusement she had told him that her grandmother Mingott and the Wellens objected to her living in a bohemian quarter 
given over to people who wrote. It was not the peril, but the poverty that her family disliked, and that shade escaped her, and she supposed they considered literature compromising. She herself had no fears of it, and the books scattered about her drawing-room, a part of the house in which books were usually supposed to be out of place, though chiefly works of fiction, had whetted Archer's interest with such new names as those of Paul Bourget, Hoysman's, and the Goncourt brothers. Ruminating on these things as he approached her door, he was once more conscious of the curious way in which she reversed his values, and of the need of thinking himself into conditions incredibly different from any that he knew if he were to be of use in her present difficulty. Nastasia opened the door, smiling mysteriously. On the bench in the hall lay a sable-lined overcoat, a folded opera hat of dull silk with a gold J.B. on the lining, and a white silk muffler. There was no mistaking the fact that these costly articles were the property of Julius Beaufort. Archer was angry, so angry, that he came near scribbling a word on his card and going away. Then he remembered that in writing to Madame Olenska he had been kept by excess of discretion from saying that he wished to see her privately. He had, therefore, no one but himself to blame if she had opened her doors to other visitors, and he entered the drawing-room with a dogged determination to make Beaufort feel himself in the way— and to outstay him. The banker stood, leaning against the mantel-shelf, which was draped with an old embroidery, held in place by brass candelabra containing church candles of yellowish wax. He had thrust his chest out, supporting his shoulders against the mantel, and resting his weight on one large patent leather foot. As Archer entered, he was smiling, and looking down on his hostess, who sat on a sofa placed at right angles to the chimney. A table banked with flowers formed a screen behind it, and against the orchids and azaleas which the young man recognized as tributes from the Beaufort hothouses, Madame Olenska sat half-reclined, her head propped on a hand, and her wide sleeve leaving the arm bare to the elbow. It was usual for ladies who received in the evening— to wear what were called simple dinner dresses. A close-fitting armor of whale-boned silk, slightly open in the neck, with lace ruffles filling in the crack, and tight sleeves with a flounce uncovering just enough wrist to show an Etruscan gold bracelet or a velvet band. But Madame Olenska, heedless of tradition, was attired in a long robe of red velvet, bordered about the chin and down the front, with a glossy black fur. Archer remembered on his last visit to Paris seeing a portrait by a new painter, Carolus Duran, whose pictures were the sensation of the salon, in which the lady wore one of these bold, sheath-like robes, with her chin nestling in fur. There was something perverse and provocative in the notion of fur worn in the evening in a heated drawing-room, and in the combination of a muffled throat and bare arms, but the effect was undeniably pleasing. "'Lord love us three whole days at Scoiter Cliff,' Beaufort was saying in his loud, sneering voice as Archer entered the room. "'You'd better take all your furs and a hot water bottle.' "'Why, is the house so cold?' she asked holding out her left hand to Archer, in a way mysteriously suggesting that she expected him to kiss it. "'No, but the missus is,' said Beaufort, nodding carelessly to the young man. "'But I thought her so kind. She came herself to invite me. Granny says I must certainly go.' "'Granny would, of course. And I say it's a shame you're going to miss the little oyster supper I'd planned for you at Delmonico's next Sunday.' with Campanini and Scalci and a lot of jolly people. She looked doubtfully from the banker to Archer. Ah, oh, that does tempt me. Except the other evening at Mrs. Struthers, I've not met a single artist since I've been here. 
"'What kind of artists? I know one or two painters. "'Very good fellows I could bring to see you if you'd allow me,' said Archer boldly. "'Painters? Are there painters in New York?' asked Beaufort, "'in a tone implying that there could be none, since he did not buy their pictures. "'And Madame Olenska said to Archer with a grave smile, "'That would be charming. But I was really thinking of dramatic artists, "'singers, actors, musicians. My husband's house was always full of them.' She said the words, my husband, as if no sinister associations were connected with them, and in a tone that seemed almost to sigh over the lost delights of her married life. Archer looked at her perplexedly, wondering if it were lightness or dissimulation that enabled her to touch so easily on the past, at the very moment when she was risking her reputation in order to break with it. I do think she went on, addressing both men, that the imprevu adds to one's enjoyment. It's perhaps a mistake to see the same people every day. It's confoundedly dull, anyhow. New York is dying of dullness, Beaufort grumbled. And when I try to liven it up for you, you go back on me. Come, think better of it. Sunday is your last chance, for Campanini leaves next week for Baltimore and Philadelphia. And I have a private room and a Steinway and they'll sing all night for me. Oh, how delicious. May I think it over and write to you tomorrow morning? She spoke amiably, yet with the least hint of dismissal in her voice. Beaufort evidently felt it, and being unused to dismissals, stood staring at her with an obstinate line between his eyes. Why not now? Oh, it's too serious a question to decide at this late hour. Do you call it late? She returned his glance coolly. Yes, because I still have to talk business with Mr. Archer for a little while. Ah, Beaufort snapped. There was no appeal from her tone, and with a slight shrug, he recovered his composure, took her hand, which he kissed with a practiced air, and, calling out from the threshold, I say, Newland, if you can persuade the Countess to stop in town, of course you're included in the supper— left the room with his heavy, important step. For a moment Archer fancied that Mr. Letterblair must have told her of his coming, but the irrelevance of her next remark made him change his mind. "'You know painters, then? You live in their milieu?' she asked, her eyes full of interest. "'Oh, not exactly. I don't know that the arts have a milieu here, any of them. They're more like a very thinly settled outskirt.' "'But you care for such things. Immensely. When I'm in Paris or London, I never miss an exhibition. I try to keep up.' She looked down at the tip of the little satin boot that peeped from her long draperies. "'I used to care immensely, too. My life was full of such things. But now I want to try not to. You want to try not to? Yes, I want to cast off all of my old life.' to become just like everybody else here. Archer reddened. You'll never be like everybody else, he said. She raised her straight eyebrows a little. Oh, don't say that. If you knew how I hate to be different. Her face had grown as somber as a tragic mask. She leaned forward, clasping her knee in her thin hands and looking away from him into remote, dark distances. I want to get away from it all, she insisted. He waited a moment and cleared his throat. I know. Mr. Letterblair has told me. Oh, that's the reason I've come. He asked me to... You see, I'm in the firm. She looked slightly surprised, and then her eyes brightened. You mean you can manage it for me? I can talk to you instead of Mr. Letterblair. Oh, that will be so much easier. Her tone touched him, and his confidence grew with his self-satisfaction. He perceived that she had spoken of business to Beaufort simply to get rid of him, and to have routed Beaufort was something of a triumph. I am here to talk about it, he repeated. She sat silent her head still propped by the arm that rested on the back of the sofa. Her face looked pale and extinguished, as if dimmed by the rich red of her dress, 
she struck Archer all of a sudden as a pathetic and even pitiful figure. Now we're coming to hard facts, he thought, conscious in himself of the same instinctive recoil that he had so often criticized in his mother and her contemporaries. How little practice he had had in dealing with unusual situations. Their very first vocabulary was unfamiliar to him and seemed to belong to fiction and the stage. In face of what was coming, he felt as awkward and embarrassed as a boy. After a pause, Madame Olenska broke out with unexpected vehemence. I want to be free. I want to wipe out all the past. I understand that. Her face warmed. Then you'll help me. First, he hesitated, perhaps I ought to know a little more. She seemed surprised. You know about my husband, my life with him. He made a sign of assent. Well, then what more is there? In this country are such things tolerated? I'm a Protestant. Our church does not forbid divorce in such cases. Certainly not. They were both silent again, and Archer felt the specter of Count Olenski's letter grimacing hideously between them. The letter filled only half a page, and was just what he had described it to be in speaking of it to Mr. Letterblair, the vague charge of an angry blackguard. But how much truth was behind it, only Count Olenski's wife could tell. I've looked through the papers you gave to Mr. Letterblair, he said at length. Well, can there be anything more abominable? No. She changed her position slightly, screening her eyes with her lifted hand. Of course you know, Archer continued, that if your husband chooses to fight the case as he threatens to... Yes. He can say things... Things that might be un and might be disagreeable to you, say them publicly so that they would get about and harm you, even if, if, I mean, no matter how unfounded they were. She paused for a long interval, so long that, not wishing to keep his eyes on her shaded face, he had time to imprint on his mind the exact shape of her other hand, the one on her knee and every detail of the three rings on her fourth and fifth fingers, among which he noticed a wedding ring did not appear. What harm could such accusations, even if he made them publicly, do me here? It was on his lips to exclaim, My poor child, far more harm than anywhere else! Instead, he answered in a voice that sounded in his ears like Mr. Letterblair's. New York society is a very small world compared with the one you've lived in, and it's ruled, in spite of appearances, by a few people with, well, rather old-fashioned ideas. She said nothing, and he continued, Our ideas about marriage and divorce are particularly old-fashioned. Our legislation favors divorce. Our social customs don't. Never? Well, not if the woman, however injured, however irreproachable, has appearances in the least degree against her, has exposed herself by any unconventional actions to, to offensive insinuations she drooped her head a little lower, and he waited again, intensely hoping for a flash of indignation or at least a brief cry of denial. None came. A little traveling clock ticked purringly at her elbow, and a log broke in two and sent up a shower of sparks. The whole hushed and brooding room seemed to be waiting silently with Archer, Yes, she murmured at length. That's what my family tell me. He winced a little. It's not unnatural. 
our family, she corrected herself, and Archer colored, for you'll be my cousin soon, she said gently. I hope so. And you take their view? He stood up at this, wandered across the room, stared with void eyes at one of the pictures against the old red damask, and came back irresolutely to her side. How could he say, Yes, if what your husband hints is true, or if you've no way of disproving it? Sincerely, she interjected as he was about to speak. He looked down into the fire. Sincerely, then, what should you gain that would compensate for the possibility, the certainty, of a lot of beastly talk? But my freedom, is that nothing? It flashed across him at that instant that the charge in the letter was true, that she hoped to marry the partner of her guilt. How was he to tell her that, if she really cherished such a plan, the laws of the state were inexorably opposed to it? The mere suspicion that the thought was in her mind made him feel harshly and impatiently towards her. "'But aren't you free as air as it is?' he returned. "'Who can touch you? "'Mr. Letterblair tells me the financial question has been settled. "'Oh, yes,' she said indifferently. "'Well, then, is it worth while to risk what may be infinitely disagreeable and painful? "'Think of the newspapers, their vileness. "'It's all stupid and narrow and unjust, but one can't make over society.' "'No,' she acquiesced and her tone was so faint and desolate that he felt a sudden remorse for his own hard thoughts. The individual in such cases is nearly always sacrificed to what is supposed to be the collective interest. People cling to any convention that keeps the family together, protects the children if there are any, he rambled on, pouring out all the stock phrases that rose to his lips in his intense desire to cover over the ugly reality which her silence seemed to have laid bare. Since she would not, or could not, say the one word that would have cleared the air, his wish was not to let her feel that he was trying to probe into her secret. Better keep on the surface, in the prudent old New York way, than risk uncovering a wound he could not heal. It's my business, you know, he went on, to help you see these things, as the people who are fondest of you see them. The Mingotts, the Wellens, the Vanderloydens, all your friends and relations. If I didn't show you honestly how they judge such questions, it wouldn't be fair of me, would it? He spoke insistently, almost pleading with her in his eagerness to cover up that yawning silence. She said slowly, No. It wouldn't be fair. The fire had crumbled down to grayness, and one of the lamps made a gurgling appeal for attention. Madame Olenska rose, wound it up, and returned to the fire, but without resuming her seat. Her remaining on her feet seemed to signify that there was nothing more for either of them to say, and Archer stood up also. "'Very well. I will do what you wish,' she said abruptly. The blood rushed to his forehead, and, taken aback by the suddenness of her surrender, he caught her two hands awkwardly in his. "'I—I I do want to help you,' he said. "'You do help me. Good night, my cousin.' He bent and laid his lips on her hands, which were cold and lifeless. She drew them away, and he turned to the door, found his coat and hat under the faint gaslight of the hall, and plunged out into the winter night, bursting with the belated eloquence of the inarticulate. End of chapter 12 This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 13 It was a crowded night at Wallach's Theatre. The play was The Chogron, with Dion Bochico in the title role, and Harry Montague and Ada Dias as the lovers. The popularity of the admirable English company was at its height, and the Chogron always packed the house. In the galleries, the enthusiasm was unreserved. In the stalls and boxes, people smiled a little at the hackneyed sentiments and claptrap situations, and enjoyed the play as much as the galleries did. There was one episode in particular that held the house from floor to ceiling. It was that in which Harry Montague, after a sad, almost monosyllabic scene of parting with Miss Dias, bade her good-bye and turned to go. The actress, who was standing near the mantelpiece and looking down into the fire, wore a grey cashmere dress, without fashionable loopings or trimmings, molded to her tall figure and flowing in long lines about her feet. Around her neck was a narrow black velvet ribbon, with the ends falling down her back. When her wooer turned from her, she rested her arms against the mantel-shelf and bowed her face in her hands. On the threshold he paused to look at her, then he stole back, lifted one of the ends of velvet ribbon, kissed it, and left the room without her hearing him or changing her attitude. And on this silent parting the curtain fell. It was always for the sake of that particular scene that Newland Archer went to see the Chogron. He thought the adieu of Montague and Ada Dias as fine as anything he'd ever seen Croisette and Brissant to in Paris, or Madge Robertson and Kendall in London. In its reticence, its dumb sorrow, it moved him more than the most famous histrionic outpourings. On the evening in question, the little scene acquired an added poignancy by reminding him, he could not have said why, of his leave-taking of Madame Olenska after their confidential talk a week or ten days earlier. It would have been as difficult to discover any resemblance between the two situations as between the appearance of the persons concerned. Newland Archer could not pretend to anything approaching the young English actor's romantic good looks, and Miss Dias was a tall, red-haired woman of monumental build, whose pale and pleasantly ugly face was utterly unlike Ellen Olenska's vivid countenance. Nor were Archer and Madame Olenska two lovers parting in heartbroken silence. They were client and lawyer, separating after a talk which had given the lawyer the worst possible impression of the client's case. Wherein, then, lay the resemblance that made the young man's heart beat with a kind of retrospective excitement? It seemed to be in Madame Olenska's mysterious faculty of suggesting tragic and moving possibilities outside the daily run of experience. She had hardly ever said a word to him, to produce this impression, but it was part of her, either a projection of her mysterious and outlandish background, or of something inherently dramatic, passionate, and unusual in herself. Archer had always been inclined to think that chance and circumstance played a small part in shaping people's lots, compared with their innate tendency to have things happen to them. This tendency he had felt from the first in Madame Olenska. The quiet, almost passive young woman struck him as exactly the kind of person to whom things were bound to happen, no matter how much she shrank from them and went out of her way to avoid them. The exciting fact was her having lived 
in an atmosphere so thick with drama that her own tendency to provoke it had apparently passed unperceived. It was precisely the odd absence of surprise in her that gave him the sense of her having been plucked out of a very maelstrom. The things she took for granted gave the measure of those she had rebelled against. Archer had left her with the conviction that Count Olensky's accusation was not unfounded. The mysterious person who figured in his wife's past as the secretary had probably not been unrewarded for his share in her escape. The conditions from which she had fled were intolerable. Past speaking of, past believing. She was young. She was frightened. She was desperate. What more natural than that she should be grateful to her rescuer? The pity was that her gratitude put her, in the law's eyes and the world's, on a par with her abominable husband. Archer had made her understand this, as he was bound to do. He had also made her understand that simple-hearted, kindly New York, on whose larger charity she had apparently counted, was precisely the place where she could least hope for indulgence. To have to make this fact plain to her, and to witness her resigned acceptance of it, had been intolerably painful to him. He felt himself drawn to her by obscure feelings of jealousy and pity, as if her dumbly confessed error had put her at his mercy, humbling yet endearing her. He was glad it was to him she had revealed her secret rather than to the cold scrutiny of Mr. Letterblair or the embarrassed gaze of her family. He immediately took it upon himself to assure them both that she had given up her idea of seeking a divorce, basing her decision on the fact that she had understood the uselessness of the proceeding. And with infinite relief, they had all turned their eyes from the unpleasantness she had spared them. I was sure Newland would manage it, Mrs. Welland had said proudly of her future son-in-law. And old Mrs. Mingott, who had summoned him for a confidential interview, had congratulated him on his cleverness and added impatiently, Silly goose, I told her myself what nonsense it was. Wanting to pass herself off as Ellen Mingott and an old maid when she has the luck to be a married woman and a countess. These incidents had made the memory of his last talk with Madame Olenska so vivid to the young man that as the curtain fell on the parting of the two actors, his eyes filled with tears, and he stood up to leave the theatre. In doing so, he turned to the side of the house behind him and saw the lady of whom he was thinking, seated in a box with the Beauforts, Lawrence Lefferts, and one or two other men. He had not spoken with her alone since their evening together, and had tried to avoid being with her in company. But now their eyes met, and as Mrs. Beaufort recognized him at the same time, and made her languid little gesture of invitation, it was impossible not to go into the box. Beaufort and Lefferts made way for him, and after a few words with Mrs. Beaufort, who always preferred to look beautiful and not have to talk, Archer seated himself behind Madame Olenska. There was no one else in the box but Mr. Sillerton Jackson, who was telling Mrs. Beaufort in a confidential undertone about Mrs. Lemuel Struther's last Sunday reception, where some people reported that there had been dancing. Under cover of this circumstantial narrative, to which Mrs. Beaufort listened with her perfect smile, and her head at just the right angle to be seen in profile from the stalls, Madame Olenska turned and spoke in a low voice. "'Do you think,' she asked, glancing toward the stage, "'he will send her a bunch of yellow roses tomorrow morning?' Archer reddened, and his heart gave a leap of surprise. He had called only twice on Madame Olenska, and each time he had sent a box of yellow roses, and each time without a card. 
She had never before made any allusion to the flowers, and he supposed she had never thought of him as the sender. Now her sudden recognition of the gift, and her associating it with a tender leave-taking on the stage, filled him with an agitated pleasure. I was thinking of that, too. I was going to leave the theater in order to take the picture away with me, he said. To his surprise, her color rose, reluctantly and duskily. She looked down at the mother-of-pearl opera glass in her smoothly gloved hands and said, after a pause, "'What do you do while May is away?' "'I stick to my work,' he answered, faintly annoyed by the question. In obedience to a long-established habit, the Wellens had left the previous week for St. Augustine, where, out of regard for the supposed susceptibility of Mr. Welland's bronchial tubes, they always spent the latter part of the winter. Mr. Welland was a mild and silent man, with no opinions but with many habits. With these habits none might interfere, and one of them demanded that his wife and daughter should always go with him on his annual journey to the south. To preserve an unbroken domesticity was essential to his peace of mind. He would not have known where his hairbrushes were, or how to provide stamps for his letters, if Mrs. Welland had not been there to tell him. As all the members of the family adored each other, and as Mr. Welland was the central object of their idolatry, it never occurred to his wife and May to let him go to St. Augustine alone, and his sons who were both in the law and could not leave New York during the winter, always joined him for Easter and traveled back with him. It was impossible for Archer to discuss the necessity of May's accompanying her father. The reputation of the Mingott's family physician was largely based on the attack of pneumonia which Mr. Welland had never had, and his insistence on St. Augustine was therefore inflexible. Originally, it had been intended that May's engagement should not be announced till her return from Florida, and the fact that it had been made known sooner could not be expected to alter Mr. Welland's plans. Archer would have liked to join the travelers and have a few weeks of sunshine and boating with his betrothed, but he, too, was bound by custom and conventions. Little arduous as his professional duties were, he would have been convicted of frivolity by the whole Mingott clan if he had suggested asking for a holiday in midwinter, and he accepted May's departure with the resignation which he perceived would have to be one of the principal constituents of married life. He was conscious that Madame Olenska was looking at him under lowered lids. "'I have done what you wished, what you advised.' she said abruptly. "'Ah, I'm glad,' he returned, embarrassed by her broaching the subject at such a moment. "'I understand that you were right,' she went on a little breathlessly, "'but sometimes life is difficult, perplexing, I know. "'And I wanted to tell you that I do feel you were right,' and that I'm grateful to you. She ended, lifting her opera glass quickly to her eyes, as the door of the box opened, and Beaufort's resonant voice broke in on them. Archer stood, and left the box and the theater. Only the day before, he had received a letter from May Welland in which, with characteristic candor, she had asked him to be kind to Ellen in their absence. She likes you and admires you so much, and you know, though she doesn't show it, she's still very lonely and unhappy. I don't think Granny understands her, or Lovell Mingott either. They really think she's much worldlier and fonder of society than she really is. And I can quite see that New York must seem dull to her, though the family won't admit it. I think she's been used to lots of things we haven't got, wonderful music and picture shows and celebrities, artists and authors and all the clever people you admire. Granny can't understand her wanting anything but lots of dinners and clothes, but I can see 
that you're almost the only person in New York who can talk to her about what she really cares for. His wise May, how he had loved her for that letter. But he had not meant to act on it. He was too busy to begin with, and he did not care, as an engaged man, to play too conspicuously the part of Madame Olenska's champion. He had an idea that she knew how to take care of herself a good deal better than the ingenious May imagined. She had Beaufort at her feet, Mr. Vanderloyden hovering above her like a protecting deity, and any number of candidates, Lawrence Lefferts among them, waiting their opportunity in the middle distance. Yet he never saw her, or exchanged a word with her, without feeling that, after all, May's ingeniousness almost amounted to a gift of divination. Ellen Olenska was lonely, and she was unhappy. End of chapter 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 14 as he came out into the lobby, Archer ran across his friend, Ned Winsett, the only one among what Janey called his clever people, with whom he cared to probe into things a little deeper than the average level of club and chop-house banter. He had caught sight, across the house, of Winsett's shabby round-shouldered back, and had once noticed his eyes turned towards the Beaufort box. The two men shook hands, and Winsett proposed a balk at a little German restaurant around the corner. Archer, who was not in the mood for the kind of talk they were likely to get there, declined on the plea that he had work to do at home, and Winsett said, Oh, well, so have I, for that matter, and I'll be the industrious apprentice, too. They strolled along together, and presently Winsett said, Look here, what I'm really after is the name of the dark lady in that swell box of yours. With the Beauforts, wasn't she? The one your friend Lefferts seems so smitten by. Archer, he could not have said why, was slightly annoyed. What the devil did Ned Winsett want with Ellen Olenska's name? And above all, why did he couple it with Lefferts's? It was unlike Winsett to manifest such curiosity, but, after all, Archer remembered he was a journalist. "'It's not for an interview, I hope,' he laughed. "'Well, not for the press, just for myself,' Winsett rejoined. "'The fact is, she's a neighbor of mine. "'Queer quarter for such a beauty to settle in. "'And she's been awfully kind to my little boy, "'who fell down her area chasing his kitten and gave himself a nasty cut. "'She rushed in, bareheaded, carrying him in her arms.' with his knee all beautifully bandaged, and was so sympathetic and beautiful that my wife was too dazzled to ask her name. A pleasant glow dilated Archer's heart. There was nothing extraordinary in the tale. Any woman would have done just as much for a neighbor's child. But it was just like Ellen, he thought, to have rushed in bareheaded, carrying the boy in her arms, and to have dazzled poor Mrs. Winsett into forgetting to ask who she was. That is, the Countess Olenska, a granddaughter of old Mrs. Mingott's. Whew, a countess, whistled Ned Winsett. Well, I didn't know countesses were so neighborly. Mingott's ain't. They would be if you'd let them. Ah, well, it was their old interminable argument as to the obstinate unwillingness of the clever people to frequent the fashionable, and both men knew there was no use in prolonging it. I wonder, Winsett broke off, how a countess happens to live in our slum. Because she doesn't care a hang where she lives, or about any of our little social signposts, said Archer, with a secret pride in his own picture of her. Hm, Been in bigger places, I suppose, the other commented. 
Well, here's my corner. He slouched off across Broadway, and Archer stood looking after him and musing on his last words. Ned Winsett had those flashes of penetration. They were the most interesting thing about him, and always made Archer wonder why they had allowed him to accept failure so stolidly at an age when most men are still struggling. Archer had known that Winsett had a wife and child, but he had never seen them. The two men always met at the Century or at some haunt of journalists and theatrical people, such as the restaurant where Winsett had proposed to go for a balk. He had given Archer to understand that his wife was an invalid, which might be true of the poor lady, or might merely mean that she was lacking in social gifts, or in evening clothes, or in both. Winsett himself had a savage abhorrence of social observances. Archer, who dressed in the evening because he thought it cleaner and more comfortable to do so, and who had never stopped to consider that cleanliness and comfort are two of the costliest items in the modest budget, regarded Winsett's attitude as part of the boring bohemian pose that always made fashionable people who changed their clothes without talking about it and were not forever harping on the number of servants one kept seem so much simpler and less self-conscious than the others. Nevertheless, he was always stimulated by Winsett, and whenever he caught sight of the journalist's lean, bearded face and melancholy eyes, he would rout him out of his corner and carry him off for a long talk. Winsett was not a journalist by choice. He was a pure man of letters, untimely born in a world that had no need of letters. But after publishing one volume of brief and exquisite literary appreciations, of which one hundred and twenty copies were sold, thirty given away, and the balance eventually destroyed by the publishers, as per contract, to make room for more marketable material, he had abandoned his real calling, and taken a sub-editorial job on a women's weekly, where fashion plates and paper patterns alternated with New England love stories and advertisements of temperance drinks. On the subject of Heath Fires, as the paper was called, he was inexhaustibly entertaining, but beneath his fun lurked the sterile bitterness of the still young man who has tried and given up. His conversation always made Archer take the measure of his own life and feel how little it contained. But Winsett's, after all, contained still less, and though their common fund of intellectual interests and curiosities made their talks exhilarating, their exchange of views usually remained within the limits of a pensive dilettantism. The fact is, life isn't much of a fit for either of us, Winsett had once said. I'm down and out, nothing to be done about it. I've got only one ware to produce, and there's no market for it here, and won't be in my time. But you're free, and you're well off. Why don't you get into touch? There's only one way to do it. Go into politics. Archer threw back his head and laughed. There one saw at a flash the unbridgeable difference between men like Winsett and the others, Archer's kind. Everyone in polite circles knew that, in America, a gentleman couldn't go into politics. But since he could hardly put it that way to Winsett, he answered evasively, Look at the career of the honest man in American politics. They don't want us. Who's they? Why don't you all get together and be they yourselves? Archer's laugh lingered on his lips in a slightly condescending smile. It was useless to prolong the discussion. Everybody knew the melancholy fate of the few gentlemen who had risked their clean linen in municipal or state politics in New York. The day was past when that sort of thing was possible. The country was in possession of the bosses and the emigrant, and decent people had to fall back on sport or culture. Culture, yes, if we had it, but there are just a few little local patches dying out here and there for lack of, well, hoeing and cross-fertilizing, the last remnants of the old European tradition that your forebears brought with them. 
But you're in a pitiful little minority. You've got no center, no competition, no audience. You're like the pictures on the walls of a deserted house, the portrait of a gentleman. You'll never amount to anything, any of you, till you roll up your sleeves and get right down into the muck. That or emigrate. God, if I could emigrate. Archer mentally shrugged his shoulders and turned the conversation back to books where Winsett, if uncertain, was always interesting. Emigrate. As if a gentleman could abandon his own country. One could no more do that than one could roll up one's sleeves and go down into the muck. A gentleman simply stayed at home and abstained. But you couldn't make a man like Winsett see that, and that was why the New York of literary clubs and exotic restaurants, though a first shake made it seem more of a kaleidoscope, turned out in the end to be a smaller box with a more monotonous pattern than the assembled atoms of Fifth Avenue. The next morning, Archer scoured the town in vain for more yellow roses. In consequence of this search, he arrived late at the office, perceived that his doing so made no difference whatever to anyone, and was filled with sudden exasperation at the elaborate futility of his life. Why should he not be, at that very moment, on the sands of St. Augustine with May Welland? No one was deceived by his pretense of professional activity. In old-fashioned legal firms like that of which Mr. Letterblair was the head, and which were mainly engaged in the management of large estates and conservative investments, there were always two or three young men fairly well off and without professional ambition who, for a certain number of hours of each day, sat at their desks, accomplishing trivial tasks or simply reading the newspapers. Though it was supposed to be proper for them to have an occupation, the crude fact of money-making was still regarded as derogatory, and the law, being a profession, was accounted a more gentlemanly pursuit than business. But none of these young men had much hope of really advancing in his profession, or any earnest desire to do so. And over many of them, the green mold of the perfunctory was already perceptibly spreading. It made Archer shiver to think that it might be spreading over him, too. He had, to be sure, other tastes and interests. He spent his vacations in European travel, cultivated the clever people May spoke of, and generally tried to keep up, as he had somewhat wistfully put it to Madame Olenska. But once he was married, what would become of this narrow margin of life in which his real experiences were lived? He had seen enough of other young men who had dreamed his dream, though perhaps less ardently, and who had gradually sunk into the placid and luxurious routine of their elders. From the office he sent a note by messenger to Madame Olenska, asking if he might call that afternoon, and begging her to let him find a reply at his club. But at the club he found nothing, nor did he receive any letter the following day. This unexpected silence mortified him beyond reason. And though the next morning he saw a glorious cluster of yellow roses behind a florist's window pane, he left it there. It was only on the third morning that he received a line by post from the Countess Olenska. To his surprise, it was dated from Scoiter Cliff, whither the Vanderloydens had promptly retreated after putting the Duke on board his steamer. I ran away, the writer began abruptly, without the usual preliminaries. The day after I saw you at the play, and these kind friends have taken me in. I wanted to be quiet and think things over. You were right in telling me how kind they were. I feel myself so safe here. I wish that you were here with us. She ended with a conventional, Yours sincerely, and without any allusion to the date of her return. 
The tone of the note surprised the young man. What was Madame Olenska running away from, and why did she feel the need to be safe? His first thought was of some dark menace from abroad. Then he reflected that he did not know her epistolary style, and that it might run to picturesque exaggeration. Women always exaggerated, and moreover, she was not wholly at her ease in English, which she often spoke as if she were translating from the French. Chemisui avait day, put in that way. The opening sentence immediately suggested that she might merely have wanted to escape from a boring round of engagements, which was very likely true, for he judged her to be capricious and easily wearied of the pleasure of the moment. It amused him to think of the Vanderloydens having carried her off to Scoiter Cliff on a second visit, and this time for an indefinite period. The doors of Scoiter Cliff were rarely and grudgingly open to visitors, and a chilly weekend was the most ever offered to the few thus privileged. But Archer had seen in his last visit to Paris the delicious play of La Biche, Le Voyage de Monsieur Perrichon, and he remembered Monsieur Perrichon's dogged and undiscouraged attachment to the young man whom he'd pulled out of the glacier. The Vanderloydens had rescued Madame Olenska from a doom almost as icy, and though there were many other reasons for being attracted to her, Archer knew that beneath them all, lay the gentle and obstinate determination to go on rescuing her. He felt a distinct disappointment on learning that she was away, and almost immediately remembered that, only the day before, he had refused an invitation to spend the following Sunday with the Reggie Chiverses at their house on the Hudson, a few miles below Scoiter Cliff. He had had his fill long ago, of the noisy, friendly parties at High Bank, with coasting, ice-boating, sleighing, long tramps in the snow, and a general flavor of mild flirting and milder practical jokes. He had just received a box of new books from his London bookseller, and had preferred the prospect of a quiet Sunday at home with his spoils. But he now went into the club writing room, wrote a hurried telegram, and told the servant to send it immediately. He knew that Mrs. Reggie didn't object to her visitors suddenly changing their minds, and that there was always a room to spare in her elastic house. End of chapter 14. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 15 Newland Archer arrived at the Chiverses on Friday evening, and on Saturday went conscientiously through all the rites appertaining to a weekend at High Bank. In the morning, he had a spin in the ice boat with his hostess and a few of the hardier guests. In the afternoon, he went over the farm with Reggie and listened, in the elaborately appointed stables, to long and impressive disquisitions on the horse. After tea, he talked in a corner of the firelit hall with a young lady who had professed herself broken-hearted when his engagement was announced, but was now eager to tell him of her own matrimonial hopes. And finally, about midnight, he assisted in putting a goldfish in one visitor's bed, dressed up a burglar in the bathroom of a nervous aunt, and saw in the small hours, by joining in a pillow fight, that ranged from the nurseries to the basement. But on Sunday, after luncheon, he borrowed a cutter and drove over to Scoiter Cliff. People had always been told that the house at Scoiter Cliff was an Italian villa. Those who had never been to Italy believed it. So did some who had. The house had been built by Mr. Vanderloyden in his youth, on his return from the Grand Tour, 
and in anticipation of his approaching marriage with Miss Louisa Dagonet. It was a large, square, wooden structure, with tongue-and-grooved walls painted pale green and white, a Corinthian portico, and fluted pilasters between the windows. From the high ground on which it stood, a series of terraces bordered by balustrades and urns descended in the steel engraving style to a small, irregular lake with an asphalt edge overhung by rare weeping conifers. To the right and left, the famous, weedless lawns, studded with specimen trees, each of a different variety, rolled away to long ranges of grass, crested with elaborate cast-iron ornaments. And below, in a hollow, lay the four-roomed stone house which the first patroon had built on the land granted him in 1612. Against the uniform sheet of snow and the grayish winter sky, the Italian villa loomed up rather grimly. Even in summer it kept its distance, and the boldest coleus bed had never ventured nearer than thirty feet from its awful front. Now, as Archer rang the bell, the long tinkle seemed to echo through a mausoleum, and the surprise of the butler, who at length responded to the call, was as great as though he had been summoned from his final sleep. Happily, Archer was of the family, and therefore— irregular though his arrival was, entitled to be informed that the Countess Olenska was out, having driven to afternoon service with Mrs. van der Luyden exactly three-quarters of an hour earlier. "'Mr. van der Luyden,' the butler continued, "'is in, sir, but my impression is that he is either finishing his nap or else reading yesterday's evening post. I heard him say, sir— on his return from church this morning, that he intended to look through the evening post after luncheon. If you like, sir, I might go to the library door and listen. But Archer, thanking him, said that he would go and meet the ladies, and the butler, obviously relieved, closed the door on him majestically. A groom took the cutter to the stables, and Archer struck through the park to the high road. The village of Scoiter Cliff was only a mile and a half away, but he knew that Mrs. van der Luyden never walked, and that he must keep to the road to meet the carriage. Presently, however, coming down a footpath that crossed the highway, he caught sight of a slight figure in a red cloak, with a big dog running ahead. He hurried forward, and Madame Olenska stopped short with a smile of welcome. "'Ah, oh, you've come!' she said, and drew her hand from her muff. The red cloak made her look gay and vivid, like the Ellen Mingott of old days, and he laughed as he took her hand and answered, I came to see what you were running away from. Her face clouded over, but she answered, Ah, well, you will see presently. The answer puzzled him. Why, do you mean that you've been overtaken? She shrugged her shoulders with a little movement, like Nastasia's, and rejoined in a lighter tone, "'Shall we walk on? I'm so cold after the sermon. What does it matter now you're here to protect me?' The blood rose to his temples, and he caught a fold of her cloak. "'Ellen, what is it? You must tell me.' "'Oh, presently, let's run a race first. My feet are freezing to the ground!' she cried, and gathering up the cloak she fled away across the snow— the dog leaping about her with challenging barks. For a moment, Archer stood watching, his gaze delighted by the flash of the red meteor against the snow. Then he started after her, and they met, panting and laughing, at a wicket that led into the park. She turned up at him and smiled. I knew you'd come. That shows you wanted me to, he returned, with a disproportionate joy in their nonsense. The white glitter of the trees filled the air with its own mysterious brightness, and as they walked over the snow the ground seemed to sing under their feet. "'Where did you come from?' Madame Olenska asked. He told her and added, "'It was because I got your note.' 
After a pause, she said, with a just perceptible chill in her voice, May asked you to take care of me. I didn't need any asking. You mean I'm so evidently helpless and defenseless? What a poor thing you must all think me. But women here seem not, seem never to feel the need, any more than the blessed in heaven. He lowered his voice to ask, What sort of need? Oh, don't ask me. I don't speak your language, she retorted petulantly. The answer smote him like a blow, and he stood still in the path, looking down at her. What did I come for, if I don't speak yours? Oh, my friend. She laid her hand lightly on his arm, and he pleaded earnestly, Ellen, why won't you tell me what's happened? She shrugged again. Does anything ever happen in heaven? He was silent, and they walked on a few yards without exchanging a word. Finally, she said, I will tell you, but where, where, where? One can't be alone for a minute in that great seminary of a house with all the doors wide open and always a servant bringing tea or a log for the fire or the newspaper. Is there nowhere in an American house where one may be by oneself? You're so shy, and yet you're so public. I always feel as if I were in the convent again or on the stage before a dreadfully polite audience that never applauds. Oh, you don't like us, Archer exclaimed. They were walking past the house of the old patroon, with its squat walls and small square windows compactly grouped around a central chimney. The shutters stood wide, and through one of the newly washed windows Archer caught the light of a fire. Why, the house is open, he said. She stood still. No, only for today, at least. I wanted to see it, and Mr. Vanderloyden had the fire lit and the windows open so that we might stop there on the way back from church this morning. She ran up the steps and tried the door. It's still unlocked. What luck? Come in and we can have a quiet talk. Mrs. Vanderloyden has driven over to see her old aunts at Rhinebeck, and we shan't be missed at the house for another hour. He followed her into the narrow passage. His spirits which had dropped at her last words, rose with an irrational leap. The homely little house stood there, its panels and brasses shining in the firelight as if magically created to receive them. A big bed of embers still gleamed in the kitchen chimney under an iron pot hung from an ancient crane. Rush-bottomed armchairs faced each other across the tiled hearth and rows of delft plates stood on shelves against the walls. Archer stooped over and threw a log upon the embers. Madame Olenska, dropping her cloak, sat down in one of the chairs. Archer leaned against the chimney and looked at her. "'You're laughing now, but when you wrote me, you were unhappy,' he said. "'Yes,' she paused. "'But I can't feel unhappy when you're here.' "'I shan't be here long,' he rejoined, "'his lips stiffening with the effort to say just so much, and no more. "'No, I know, but I'm improvident. "'I live in the moment when I'm happy.' "'The words stole through him like a temptation, "'and to close his senses to it, "'he moved away from the hearth and stood gazing out "'at the black tree bowls against the snow.' But it was as if she, too, had shifted her place. And he still saw her, between himself and the trees, drooping over the fire with her indolent smile. Archer's heart was beating insubordinately. What if it were from him that she had been running away, and if she had waited to tell him so till they were here alone together in this secret room Ellen, if I'm really a help to you, if you really wanted me to come, tell me what's wrong, tell me what it is you're running away from, he insisted. He spoke without shifting his position, without even turning to look at her. If the thing was to happen, it was to happen in this way, with the whole width of the room between them, and his eyes still fixed on the outer snow. 
For a long moment she was silent, and in that moment Archer imagined her, almost heard her, stealing up behind him to throw her light arms around his neck. While he waited, soul and body throbbing with the miracle to come, his eyes mechanically received the image of a heavily coated man with his fur collar turned up, who was advancing along the path to the house. The man was Julius Beaufort. Ha <laughs> ha! Archer cried, bursting into a laugh. Madame Olenska had sprung up and moved to his side, slipping her hand into his, but after a glance through the window, her face paled, and she shrank back. So that was it, Archer said derisively. I didn't know he was here, Madame Olenska murmured. Her hand still clung to Archer's, but he drew away from her and, walking into the passage, threw open the door of the house. Hello, Beaufort. This way. Madame Olenska was expecting you, he said. During his journey back to New York the next morning, Archer relived with a fatiguing vividness his last moments at Scoiter Cliff. Beaufort, though clearly annoyed at finding him with Madame Olenska, had, as usual, carried off the situation high-handedly. His way of ignoring people whose presence inconvenienced him actually gave them, if they were sensitive to it, a feeling of invisibility, of non-existence. Archer, as the three strolled back through the park, was aware of this odd sense of disembodiment, and, humbling as it was to his vanity, it gave him the ghostly advantage of observing unobserved. Beaufort had entered the little house with his usual easy assurance, but he could not smile away the vertical line between his eyes. It was fairly clear that Madame Olenska had not known that he was coming, though her words to Archer had hinted at the possibility. At any rate, she had evidently not told him where she was going when she left New York, and her unexplained departure had exasperated him. The ostensible reason of his appearance was the discovery— the very night before, of a perfect little house. Not in the market, which was really just the thing for her, but would be snapped up instantly if she didn't take it, and he was loud in mock reproaches for the dance she had led him in running away, just as he had found it. If only this new dodge for talking along a wire had been a little bit nearer perfection, I might have told you all this from town, and been toasting my toes before the club fire at this minute— "'Instead of tramping after you through the snow,' he grumbled, "'disguising a real irritation under the pretense of it. "'And at this opening Madame Olenska twisted the talk away "'to the fantastic possibility that they might one day "'actually converse with each other from street to street, "'or even, incredible dream, from one town to another. "'This struck from all three allusions to Edgar Poe and Jules Verne "'and such platitudes as naturally rise to the lips of the most intelligent "'when they are talking against time "'and dealing with a new invention in which it would seem ingenuous to believe too soon. "'And the question of the telephone carried them safely back to the big house. "'Mrs. van der Luyden had not yet returned.' and Archer took his leave and walked off to fetch the cutter while Beaufort followed the Countess Olenska indoors. It was probable that, little as the van der Luydens encouraged unannounced visits, he could count on being asked to dine and sent back to the station to catch the nine o'clock train. But more than that he would certainly not get, for it would be inconceivable to his hosts that a gentleman travelling without luggage should wish to spend the night— and distasteful to them to propose it to a person with whom they were on terms of such limited cordiality as Beaufort. Beaufort knew all this, and must have foreseen it, and his taking the long journey for so small a reward gave the measure of his impatience. He was undeniably in pursuit of the Countess Olenska, and Beaufort had only one object in view in his pursuit— of pretty women. 
His dull and childless home had long since palled on him, and, in addition to more permanent consolations, he was always in quest of amorous adventures in his own set. This was the man from whom Madame Olenska was avowedly flying. The question was whether she had fled because his importunities displeased her, or because she did not wholly trust herself to resist them. Unless, indeed, all her talk of flight had been a blind, and her departure no more than a maneuver. Archer did not really believe this. Little as he had actually seen of Madame Olenska, he was beginning to think that he could read her face, and if not her face, her voice, and both had betrayed annoyance and even dismay at Beaufort's sudden appearance. But, after all, if this were the case, was it not worse than if she had left New York for the express purpose of meeting him? If she had done that, she ceased to be an object of interest. She threw in her lot with the vulgarest of dissemblers, a woman engaged in a love affair with Beaufort, classed herself irretrievably. No, it was worse a thousand times if— Judging Beaufort, and probably despising him, she was yet drawn to him by all that gave him an advantage over the other men about her. His habit of two continents and two societies, his familiar association with artists and actors and people generally in the world's eye, and his careless contempt for local prejudices. Beaufort was vulgar. He was uneducated. He was purse-proud. But the circumstances of his life, and a certain native shrewdness, made him better worth talking to than many men, morally and socially his betters, whose horizon was bounded by the Battery and the Central Park. How should anyone coming from a wider world not feel the difference and be attracted by it? Madame Olenska, in a burst of irritation, had said to Archer that he and she did not talk the same language, and the young man knew that in some respects this was true. But Beaufort understood every turn of her dialect, and spoke it fluently. His view of life, his tone, his attitude, were merely a coarser reflection of those revealed in Count Olenski's letter. This might seem to be his disadvantage with Count Olenski's wife, but Archer was too intelligent to think that a young woman like Ellen Olenska would necessarily recoil from everything that reminded her of her past. She might believe herself wholly in revolt against it, but what had charmed her in it would still charm her, even though it were against her will. Thus, with a painful impartiality, did the young man make out the case for Beaufort and for Beaufort's victim. A longing to enlighten her was strong in him, and there were moments when he imagined that all she asked was to be enlightened. That evening he unpacked his books from London. The box was full of things he had been waiting for impatiently, a new volume of Herbert Spencer, another collection of the prolific Alphonse Daudet's brilliant tales, and a novel called Middlemarch, as to which there had lately been interesting things said in the reviews. He had declined three dinner invitations in favor of this feast, but though he turned the pages with the sensuous joy of the book lover, he did not know what he was reading and one book after another dropped from his hand. Suddenly among them he lit on a small volume of verse which he had ordered because the name had attracted him, The House of Life. He took it up and found himself plunged in an atmosphere unlike any he had ever breathed in books, so warm, so rich, and yet so ineffably tender, that it gave a new and haunting beauty to the most elementary of human passions. All through the night he pursued through those enchanted pages the vision of a woman who had the face of Ellen Olenska. But when he woke the next morning and looked out at the brownstone houses across the street, and thought of his desk 
in Mr. Letterblair's office, and the family pew in Grace Church. His hour in the park of Scoiter Cliff became as far outside the pale of probability as the visions of the night. "'Mercy, how pale you look, Newland!' Janey commented over the coffee cups at breakfast, and his mother added, "'Newland, dear, I've noticed lately that you've been coughing. I do hope you're not letting yourself be overworked.' For it was the conviction of both ladies that, under the iron despotism of his senior partners, the young man's life was spent in the most exhausting professional labors, and he had never thought it necessary to undeceive them. The next two or three days dragged by heavily. The taste of the usual was like cinders in his mouth, and there were moments when he felt as if he were being buried alive under his future. He heard nothing of the Countess Olenska or of the perfect little house, and though he met Beaufort at the club, they merely nodded at each other across the whist tables. It was not until the fourth evening that he found a note awaiting him on his return home. Come late tomorrow. I must explain to you, Ellen. Those were the only words it contained. The young man who was dining out thrust the note into his pocket, smiling a little at the Frenchness of the to you. After dinner he went to a play, and it was not until his return home after midnight that he drew Madame Olenska's missive out again and reread it slowly a number of times. There were several ways of answering it, and he gave a considerable thought to each one during the watches of an agitated night. That on which, when morning came, he finally decided was to pitch some clothes into a portmanteau and jump on board a boat that was leaving that very afternoon for St. Augustine. End of Chapter 15 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 16 When Archer walked down the sandy main street of St. Augustine, to the house which had been pointed out to him as Mr. Wellens, and saw May Welland standing under a magnolia with the sun in her hair. He wondered why he had waited so long to come. Here was truth. Here was reality. Here was the life that belonged to him. And he, who fancied himself so scornful of arbitrary restraints, had been afraid to break away from his desk because of what people might think of his stealing a holiday. Her first exclamation was, Newland, has anything happened? And it occurred to him that it would have been more feminine if she had instantly read in his eyes why he had come. But when he answered, Yes, I found I had to see you, and he saw how easily he would be forgiven, and how soon even Mr. Letter Blair's mild disapproval would be smiled away by a tolerant family. Early as it was, the main street was no place for any but formal greetings, and Archer longed to be alone with May and to pour out all his tenderness and his impatience. It still lacked an hour to the late Welland breakfast time, and instead of asking him to come in, she proposed that they should walk out to an old orange garden beyond the town. She had just been for a row on the river, and the sun that netted the little waves with gold seemed to have caught her in its meshes. Across the warm brown of her cheek, her blown hair glittered like silver wire, and her eyes, too, looked lighter, almost pale in their youthful limpidity. 
as she walked beside Archer with her long, swinging gait. Her face wore the vacant serenity of a young marble athlete. To Archer's strained nerves, the vision was as soothing as the sight of the blue sky and the lazy river. They sat down on a bench under the orange trees, and he put his arm about her and kissed her. It was like drinking at a cold spring with the sun on it. But his pressure may have been more vehement than he intended, for the blood rose to her face, and she drew back as if he had startled her. What is it? he asked, smiling. And she looked at him with surprise and answered, Nothing. A slight embarrassment fell on them, and her hand slipped out of his. It was the only time that he had kissed her on the lips, except for their fugitive embrace in the Beaufort Conservatory. And he saw that she was disturbed and shaken out of her cool, boyish composure. "'Tell me what you do all day,' he said, crossing his arms under his tilted back head and pushing his hat forward to screen the sun-dazzle. To let her talk about familiar and simple things— was the easiest way of carrying on his own independent train of thought, and he sat listening to her simple chronicle of swimming, sailing, and riding, varied by an occasional dance at the primitive inn when a man of war came in. A few pleasant people from Philadelphia and Baltimore were picnicking at the inn, and the Selfridge Marys had come down for three weeks because Kate Mary had bronchitis. They were planning to lay out a lawn tennis court on the sands, but no one but Kate and May had rackets, and most of the people had not even heard of the game. All this kept her very busy, and she had not had time to do more than look at the little vellum book that Archer had sent her the week before, the sonnets from the Portuguese. But she was learning by heart how they brought the good news from Ghent to Aix, because it was one of the first things he had ever read to her, and it amused her to be able to tell him that Kate Mary— had never even heard of a poet called Robert Browning. Presently she started up, exclaiming that they would be late for breakfast, and they hurried back to the tumble-down house, with its paintless porch and unpruned hedge of plumbago and pink geraniums, where the Wellens were installed for the winter. Mr. Wellens, Sensitive domesticity shrank from the discomforts of the slovenly southern hotel, and at immense expense, and in face of almost insuperable difficulties, Mrs. Welland was obliged, year after year, to improvise an establishment partly made up of discontented New York servants and partly drawn from the local African supply. The doctors want my husband to feel that he is in his own home, Otherwise he would be so wretched that the climate would not do him any good, she explained, winter after winter, to the sympathizing Philadelphians and Baltimoreans. And Mr. Welland, beaming across a breakfast table miraculously supplied with the most varied delicacies, was presently saying to Archer, You see, my dear fellow, we camp. We literally camp. I tell my wife and May that I want to teach them how to rough it. Mr. and Mrs. Welland had been as much surprised as their daughter by the young man's sudden arrival, but it had occurred to him to explain that he had felt himself on the verge of a nasty cold, and this seemed to Mr. Welland an all-sufficient reason for abandoning any duty. "'You can't be too careful, especially towards spring,' he said, heaping his plate with straw-colored griddle cakes and drowning them in golden syrup. If I'd only been as prudent at your age, May would have been dancing at the assemblies now, instead of spending her winters in a wilderness with an old invalid. Oh, but I love it here, Papa, you know I do. If only Newland could stay, I should like it a thousand times better than New York. Newland must stay till he has quite thrown off his cold, said Mrs. Welland indulgently, and the young man laughed and said he supposed there was such a thing as one's profession— he managed, however, after an exchange of telegrams with the firm, to make his cold last a week, and it shed an ironic light on the situation to know that Mr. Letterblair's indulgence was partly due to the satisfactory way in which his brilliant young junior partner had settled the troublesome matter of the Olenski divorce. 
Mr. Letterblair had let Mrs. Welland know that Mr. Archer had rendered an invaluable service to the whole family, and that old Mrs. Manson Mingott had been particularly pleased. And one day, when May had gone for a drive with her father in the only vehicle the place produced, Mrs. Welland took occasion to touch on a topic which she had always avoided in her daughter's presence. I'm afraid Ellen's ideas are not at all like ours. She was barely eighteen when Medora Manson took her back to Europe. You remember the excitement when she appeared in black at her coming-out ball. Another of Medora's fads. Really, this time it was almost prophetic. That must have been at least twelve years ago, and since then, Ellen has never been to America. No wonder she is completely Europeanized. But European society is not given to divorce. Countess Olenska thought she would be conforming to American ideas in asking for her freedom. It was the first time that the young man had pronounced her name since he left Scoiter Cliff, and he felt the color rise to his cheek. Mrs. Welland smiled compassionately. That is just like the extraordinary things that foreigners invent about us. They think we dine at two o'clock and countenance divorce. That is why it seems to me so foolish to entertain them when they come to New York. They accept our hospitality, and then they go home and repeat the same stupid stories. Archer made no comment on this, and Mrs. Welland continued, but we do most thoroughly appreciate your persuading Ellen to give up the idea. Her grandmother and her uncle Lovell could do nothing with her. Both of them have written that her changing her mind was entirely due to your influence. In fact, she said so to her grandmother. She has an unbounded admiration for you. Poor Ellen. She always was a wayward child. I wonder what her fate will be. And what we've all contrived to make it, he felt like answering. If you'd all of you rather she should be Beaufort's mistress than some decent fellow's wife, you've certainly gone the right way about it. He wondered what Mrs. Welland would have said if he had uttered the words, instead of merely thinking them. He could picture the sudden decomposure of her firm, placid features, to which a lifelong mastery over trifles had given an air of facetious authority. Traces still lingered on them of fresh beauty, like her daughter's, and he asked himself if May's face was doomed to thicken in the same middle-aged image of invincible innocence. Oh, no, he did not want May to have that kind of innocence, the innocence that seals the mind against imagination and the heart against experience. I verily believe, Mrs. Welland continued, that if the horrible business had come out in the newspapers, it would have been my husband's death blow. I don't know any of the details. I only ask not to, as I told poor Ellen when she tried to talk to me about it. Having an invalid to care for, I have to keep my mind bright and happy. But Mr. Welland was terribly upset. He had a slight temperature every morning while we were waiting to hear what had been decided. It was the horror of his girl's learning that such things were possible. But, of course, dear Newland, you felt that, too. We all knew that you were thinking of May. I'm always thinking of May, the young man rejoined, rising to cut short the conversation. He had meant to seize the opportunity of his private talk with Mrs. Welland, to urge her to advance the date of his marriage. But he could think of no arguments that would move her, and with a sense of relief, he saw Mr. Welland and May driving up to the door. His only hope was to plead again with May, and on the day before his departure he walked with her to the ruinous garden of the Spanish mission. The background lent itself to allusions to European scenes, and May, who was looking her loveliest, under a wide-brimmed hat that cast a shadow of mystery over her too clear eyes, kindled into eagerness as he spoke of Grenada and the Alhambra. We might be seeing it all this spring, even the Easter ceremonies at Seville, he urged, exaggerating his demands in the hope of a larger concession. Easter in Seville, and it will be Lent next week, she laughed. Why shouldn't we be married in Lent, he rejoined, 
but she looked so shocked that he saw his mistake. Of course, I didn't mean that, dearest, but soon after Easter, so that we could sail at the end of April. I know I could arrange it at the office. She smiled dreamily upon the possibility, but he perceived that to dream of it sufficed her. It was like hearing him read aloud out of his poetry books the beautiful things that could not possibly happen in real life. Oh, do go on, Newland. I do love your descriptions. But why should they be only descriptions? Why shouldn't we make them real? We shall, dearest, of course, next year. Her voice lingered over it. Don't you want them to be real sooner? Can't I persuade you to break away now? She bowed her head, vanishing from him completely under her conniving hat-brim. Why should we dream away another year? Look at me, dear. Don't you understand how I want you for my wife? For a moment she remained motionless. Then she raised on him eyes of such despairing clearness that he half released her waist from his hold. But suddenly her look changed and deepened inscrutably. I'm not sure if I do understand, she said. Is it... Is it because you're not certain of continuing to care for me? Archer sprang up from his seat. My God! Perhaps. I don't know, he broke out angrily. May Welland rose also. As they faced each other, she seemed to grow in womanly stature and dignity. Both were silent for a moment, as if dismayed by the unforeseen trend of their words, and then she said in a low voice, If that is it, is there someone else? Someone else, between you and me? He echoed her words slowly, as though they were only half intelligible, and he wanted time to repeat the question to himself. She seemed to catch the uncertainty of his voice, for she went on in a deepening tone, Let us talk frankly, Newland. Sometimes I've felt a difference in you, especially since our engagement has been announced. Dear, what madness! He recovered himself to exclaim. She met his protest with a faint smile. If it is, it won't hurt us to talk about it. She paused and added, lifting her head with one of her noble movements. Or even if it's true, why shouldn't we speak of it? You might so easily have made a mistake. He lowered his head, staring at the black leaf pattern on the sunny path at their feet. Mistakes are always easy to make, but if I had made one of the kind you suggest, is it likely that I should be imploring you to hasten our marriage? She looked downward, too, disturbing the pattern with a point of her sunshade while she struggled for expression. Yes, she said at length. You might want, once and for all, to settle the question. It's one way. Her quiet lucidity startled him, but did not mislead him into thinking her insensible. Under her hat-brim he saw the pallor of her profile and the slight tremor of the nostril above her resolutely steadied lips. Well, he questioned, sitting down on the bench and looking up at her with a frown that he tried to make playful. She dropped back into her seat and went on. You mustn't think that a girl knows as little as her parents imagined. One hears and one notices. One has one's own feelings and ideas. And, of course, long before you told me that you cared for me, I'd known that there was someone else you were interested in. Everyone was talking about it two years ago at Newport. And once I saw you sitting together on the veranda at a dance. And when she came back into the house, her face was sad, and I felt sorry for her. I remembered it afterwards when we were engaged. Her voice had sunk almost to a whisper, and she sat clasping and unclasping her hands about the handle of her sunshade. The young man laid his upon them with a gentle pressure. His heart dilated 
with an inexpressible relief. My dear child, was that it? If you only knew the truth! She raised her head quickly. Then there is a truth I don't know? He kept his hand over hers. I meant the truth about the old story you speak of. But that's what I want to know, Newland, what I ought to know. I couldn't have my happiness made out of a wrong, an unfairness to somebody else, and I want to believe that it would be the same with you. What sort of life could we build on such foundations? Her face had taken on a look of such tragic courage that he felt like bowing himself down at her feet. I've wanted to say this for a long time, she went on. I wanted to tell you that when two people really love each other, I understand that there may be situations which make it right that they should, should go against public opinion. And if you feel yourself in any way pledged, pledged to the person we've spoken of, and if, if there is any way, any way in which you can fulfill your pledge, even by her getting a divorce, Newland, don't give her up because of me. His surprise at discovering that her fears had fastened upon an episode so remote and so completely of the past as his love affair with Mrs. Thorley Rushworth gave way to wonder at the generosity of her view. There was something superhuman in an attitude so recklessly unorthodox, and if other problems had not pressed on him, he would have been lost in wonder at the prodigy of the Wellens' daughter urging him to marry his former mistress. But he was still dizzy with a glimpse of the precipice they had skirted, and full of a new awe at the mystery of young girlhood. For a moment he could not speak, and then he said, There is no pledge, no obligation whatever, of the kind you think. Such cases don't always present themselves quite as simply as, but that's no matter. I love your generosity because I feel as you do about those things. I feel that each case must be judged individually on its own merits, irrespective of stupid conventionalities. I mean, each woman's right to her liberty. He pulled himself up startled by the turn his thoughts had taken, and went on, looking at her with a smile. Since you understand so many things, dearest, can't you go a little further and understand the uselessness of our submitting to another form of the same foolish conventionalities? If there's no one and nothing between us, isn't that an argument for marrying quickly, rather than for more delay. She flushed with joy and lifted her face to his. As he bent to it, he saw that her eyes were full of happy tears. But in another moment she seemed to have descended from her womanly eminence to helpless and timorous girlhood, and he understood that her courage and initiative were all for others and that she had none for herself. It was evident that the effort of speaking had been much greater than her studied composure betrayed, and that at his first word of reassurance she had dropped back into the usual, as a too adventurous child takes refuge in its mother's arms. Archer had no heart to go on pleading with her. He was too much disappointed at the vanishing of the new being who had cast that one deep look at him from her transparent eyes. May seemed to be aware of his disappointment, but without knowing how to alleviate it. And they stood up and walked silently home. End of chapter 16 This is Bookman here. I hope you enjoyed today's audiobook. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, but more importantly, if you're looking to lose one pound per day, guaranteed, make sure you check out the description, click or copy that link, and of course, we'll see you next time, and remember, you are appreciated.